speak. And as usual, we start with our chaplain prayer, and we have police chaplain Art Mavro here today to help us um, start the meeting with a prayer. And I hope you'll help us with the pledges following the prayer. Thank you. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we pray for wisdom, for strength, for courage to do what is right and good for all citizens. May we put the interest of others above our own. May we act with love for the common good. May we, may we be good neighbors, recognizing your image in every person here. We thank you again for this council, our mayor, our city staff, our first responders, our hospital staff, and all those who work to make this place we call home, such a wonderful city. In the name of Jesus, who, whose per perfect love sets us free from all of our fears. Amen. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, a pledge of allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Art. He'll shift. We will now open the meeting uh, for, uh, there are no proclamations, let me say that first, and now we move into public comment, and issues or concerns not on the regular agenda may be raised by the public at this time. Citizens should speak from the podium, address all comments to the DS, begin by stating their name and address or single member district number, and limit their remarks to less than three minutes. Do we have anyone in the audience today who would like to come forward and make public comment? Going once, going twice. Sold. Sold. Public comment is now over. We will move into the consent agenda. Larry, do you have an item to pull from consent? No, ma'am. Karen? No, ma'am. Lucy? E. E. I'm going to pull D. Harry? No, ma'am. Tom? No, ma'am. Tommy? No, ma'am. All right. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of items D and E? So moved. So moved by Karen, seconded by Lucy. Any public comment concerning the consent agenda and the items with the exception of items D and E? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda with the exception of items D and E, please say aye. 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 Hearing no no's, the consent aye. agenda is approved. We will move to item D, consider approving the tax increment reinvestment zone tiers incentive funding for seven private projects in the North Tiers area for the properties located at 2600 MLK Drive, 901, 903, 905, 909, 1,000 and 2626 North Chabern, totaling 477,846, and three private projects in the South Tiers area for the properties located at 402 West Beauregard, 213 and 215 South Chabern, and 109 South Chabern, totaling $199,141, and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all necessary documents. You're on, John. Um, first, I'd ask if you have any questions or I have a brief presentation. To I'd like a presentation. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and that's not it.
if you like, I could actually just kind of go down the list and start describing the projects, or if you want well, to wait a few minutes. do we have minutes. pictures? We do have a few, hopefully. Um, Are we waiting for them to load up? Well, they're looking for it, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we had some pictures on our documents. So I guess anybody here on the DS can pull up on their, if you brought your computer, you can pull them up. If you didn't, then we'll wait. Another option, I, I could help them find that. Maybe if you go on to item E, and then we could come back to D after that. Okay. Let's um, hold off on item D. We'll go to item E, which is the second reading of an ordinance amending the budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2022, and ending September 30th, 2023, for an additional full-time parks position for the purpose of maintenance activities within the tax increment, investment zones, and capital expenses. Tina... You're on. Thank you, Mayor. Tina Dersky, Director of Finance. Um, this was the second reading of the budget amendment that amended the tiers fund to fund the, um, the personnel to uh, clean up the Chadburn corridor and things like that. And then the second one was for the PFC applications uh, out of the PFC fund. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and finish the second reading. I was against it from the beginning, so I wanted it, the record to show that I was still voting against it. Okay. With that, do I have um, any other questions or comments from anyone on council? Then may I have a motion for approval? Move to approve as presented. Second. Thank you. Second by Harry. Um, any public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of approving item E, please say aye. Aye. With none opposed, motion, uh, one opposed, motion passes six to one. We will try going back to item D. John, you want to come back up, or are you back in the back? <laughs> well, it's... It's a big file. I think the pictures are big, and so that's what may be causing part of the issue. Again, we could possibly move on and maybe take it later in the meeting if that works for you all and see if we can get that resolved. Um. All right, we will come back to item D in a few minutes. I hope it loads. Is it loading now? The question mark is if it's repairing, is it repairing all presentations or simply the presentation of item D? That's what we need an answer to because there's no reason to move forward if it's holding up all presentations. Mine's asking that we move to something else for the time being while they work on uploading that other presentation. So it's only holding up the one presentation, not the everybody's presentation? It looks like the, the DMO's presentation is loaded. Okay. All right. So what we will do is move into the regular agenda. 
Comments regarding items on the regular agenda may be made by the public when each item is discussed as outlined above. Applicants, proponents, and appellants are exempt from the time limit above and instead must limit their remarks to less than five minutes. Item A is the presentation of the Destination Marketing Organization's quarterly report, and Chamber of Commerce President CEO Walt Coning is here to present. Thanks, Mayor Gunter. Good morning, council people, and uh, good morning, everyone else. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to talk a little bit about what we did in 2022 at the DMO and what our plans are for 2023 as they're unfolding. Green button, right? We saw some interesting trends emerge in 2022, which were anticipated. Um, we have seen a pullback in business travel generally across the United States in the post-COVID economy. And we have been to some degree affected by that pullback here in terms of our hotel bookings in 2022. I will say, however, though, in 2022, we had 67 planned events. Uh, and right now, where we sit in Q1 of 23, we have 74. So we do see some positive trending in terms of bookings into 2023. Just to give you an overview of some of the bookings that we saw last year, um, some were repeats, and we take the repeats very seriously because we want to make sure that all the people who come to visit our community, whether they've been here before for an event or coming for a new event, have an excellent experience and continue to come back. If we look at the uh, tattoo convention, that's a good news story in that they had one event, now is two events, and they're continuing to grow those, so that's a good one. And if you look at those in Amber, uh, those were new ones for 2022. And some of them were quite unique and innovative, including the Windmill School, Mooney Aircraft Clinic, and some others. So it was a uh, recovery year in 2022, and we did have some good new events that we saw as a result. Visitor Center continues to be a big draw. Uh, we did have growing numbers of visitors at the Visitor Center in 2022. Uh, we had a, over 2,000 from Texas, about 1,600 from other states. International is still a bit small, but we will see an uptick in that from Italy as my wife's family is going to be coming this summer, so we'll see some uh, diversity in the international uh, with a total of 3869. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Visitor Center and some plans we have for that into 2023 a little bit later in my presentation. We did a lot of earned media in 2022. Uh, we did... Um, we were featured in 23 online publica publications, uh, YouTube bloggers, and uh, Texas Country, Country Reporter. Uh, so we did have a good showing in terms of earned media. Some of that earned media resulted in us again being named the number one true Western city in the nation. By true Western, I would think. Our print and digital advertising spanned a lot of different publications. Uh, we were heavy on print media, but we did a lot on virtual as well. Um, we really focused on Texas and the Texas travel market, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that when we talk about some of our statistics. We also marketed to the shoulder states to capture that important drive market. Our public relations efforts yielded a lot of distinctions and designations in 2022. As I mentioned before, we were ranked number one true Western town in 2022, following a number two rating in 2021. Uh, we hosted the wine tent at San Angelo Stock Show and Rodeo. We did rebrand the organization. You can see the new branding on the lower right-hand corner of the slide. And we've received multiple advertising grants from Travel Texas and the Office of the Governor, economic development and travel and tourism through ARPA funds. I'll continue on there. I won't read all these, but we did have a great year in 2022 in terms of our public relations efforts. I would like to point out our Howard College on Hospitality Management certification work began in 22 and will continue into 2023. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about our 2023 objectives. Social media, we saw some ramp up in social media in 2022. We did launch our brand new website, and if you haven't visited it, we encourage you to do so. It's quite uh, popular, very easy to use, very well received, uh, with 375,000 page views for a new website. Those are pretty impressive numbers. 
If we look at the others across all the platforms, we saw growth in terms of followers and viewers in 2022. We look at our occupancy rate and daily average, average daily rate, uh, we see kind of a mixed story. Uh, what we saw, if we looked at 2021 versus 2022, it's virtually flat, in fact, a little bit back in terms of occupancy rate, but we did see a significant appreciation in terms of the average daily rate. And so that I see as a positive development. If we look at where we launched into 2023, we started the year strong with strong gains on both the average occupancy and the average daily rate as we move through January and into February. If you look at our plans for 2023, um, obviously we've got a lot of interesting things going on at the uh, DMO with some staff changes and some recruitment efforts, which I'll touch on at the end of my presentation. But we were named in the top 10 Western towns by True West Magazine for the fifth year in a row. This time we came in 10th. Um, why we moved from first to 10th is anybody's guess. I don't see any ground truth in either the winning community or us that would change us that dramatically. My suspicion is there's probably some process or politics behind some of that, but we're still in the top 10 and we're still very proud of that designation. Did we run an ad in the text in the, this year in that magazine? Because I, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, we Because I understand that impacted our ability to yeah, go back and get number one again because we didn't run an ad. Funny thing about earned media is it's not always earned. It's sometimes bought and paid for through other means, and uh, I suspect that was part of what happened here. Still landed in the top 10. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of communities that competed, so we are going to work real hard to continue to improve in that area. I wanted to touch on one small success story that's emergent. Um, we are a film-friendly community. We have had the Revolution Film Festival. It will be the fourth year in 2023. And uh, we do have some film production going on in San Angelo right now. One of the winners of the Revolution Film Festival in 2023 is actually producing a film here. And that's going to put us uh, on the map in some respects with respect to film. And I think that that's an important growth opportunity for us in 2023 and beyond, attracting those kinds of activities. They put a lot of heads in beds. And they're very, very important to, for our, popularity, uh, our uh, publicity. There we go. We will be resuming our Goodfellow Newcomer Tours in 2023, actually starting in April. Uh, we have had a hiatus there due to COVID and other reasons, but we're really happy to begin establishing those critical linkages between ourselves and those who are serving our country at Goodfellows to bring them back into town and to get them familiar with what's going on there. I'll also note that I personally go every month to greet the newcomers on behalf of the city and chamber and DMO to make sure they feel welcome and feel able to come to town and enjoy their stay here. Our marketing in 2023 uh, will again be uh, reliant a lot on print media, very similar to 2022, and we will be working with True West Magazine in order to continue to have that designation going forward. I will say, with respect to our print media advertising, we have done a top to bottom assessment of all of our ads. Uh, I've looked at every ad that we've placed over the last five years in order to tighten up the quality of the ads, to standardize on the format for the branding strength, and to make sure that going forward we have the best possible quality of the ads. We did find some issues with respect to some of the ads, primarily where we took big ads and made them small, and we lost some of the pictures as a result. And we've come up with a new set of standards for our advertising going forward, which will eliminate that problem. We're going to go with standard color, standard fonts, standard layout, and varying the photography and presentation to, to the specific uh, messages that we're trying to send within the publication of questions. So it's, we're making some progress there. We're going to continue to work with, as I said, Travel Texas and others. Uh, in order to get the word out 
And we are going to be focusing again on the Texas drive market and the shoulder states as a primary focus. But we are working to develop our international markets. We will be going to conferences in Mexico and Canada to promote San Angelo as a travel destination, some in conjunction with Travel Texas. And that way we can uh, use the Texas brand to draw people into San Angelo for visits. We've gone to Texas, I mean to Mexico and Canada before and have not had good results. So why are we going back to Mexico and Canada again? Because we haven't seemed to be able to pull from there. Well, we think that uh, in the post-COVID situation, I think we, we, we had some disadvantage, particularly with international travel during COVID. We want to see what uh, the post-COVID world looks like from an international standpoint. San Angelo has gotten very popular internationally on the economic development front as well. We think it's worth the effort and expense to uh, try it again. If it doesn't work well, uh, we will uh, reassess that in the future. So who are we reaching out to in Canada and Mexico that we think would be able to bring somebody here? Primary audience of these events are travel planners and uh, event planners. Our Unity Dinner, we just had last week, it went very well. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Unity Dinner is an annual event put on, that put on by travel, the Texas travel industry to bring elected officials together with travel professionals in order to get positive in, uh, relationships built for future legislative action and to just generally put the travel and tourism industry on the map from the perspective of our elected officials. Uh, it was a good event and we appreciate all those from the electeds who participated and uh, we look forward to continuing to work on that in 2023. I want to talk a little bit about some new services that we've incorporated into the DMO uh, arsenal. Uh, it's a way that, uh, it's a set of programs that we use to further understand and better understand our metrics, who's visiting our community, how long they're staying, what their demographics look like, and what the trending looks like uh, from previous years into the current year. Uh, we are using a program called Datafy. Uh, it uses geolocation data to identify how many people are in a given location during a given time period. And everything about them that is available is also available through this service. So we have begun to use this, and we have some, I think, pretty interesting results to look at as a result. Uh, we will continue to use Datafy through uh, the year, uh, assessing its quality and the effectiveness of the information it's providing. But what this program can allow us to do is to ring fence a specific location during a specific time frame and look at who went there. So we're looking at Christmas at Fort Concho, we're looking at the Christmas parade, we're looking at stock show, we're looking at other big events to try to understand who's coming and what they look like in terms of their demographics. This is just a single report uh, it's a high-level report and it was selected as such for this meeting because I wanted to give you some ideas on what this is going to start giving us in terms of metrics. Um, if we looked at 2022 in its totality, if we look at total trips, uh, we're up 8.4 percent over 2021. So those are out-of-town visitors coming to our communities up 8.4 percent. Our visitor days are uh, oh, almost 6 million visitor days, and that's up 4.1% over 2021. So we see some positive moves there that aren't necessarily reflected in the hotel occupancy rates. And the reason for that is because we're seeing the average length of stay drop 4.5%. So people are coming as more day trippers. And our unique visitors, I think, is very encouraging in that these are people these are unique visits, so this means an individual who has visited our community counts in this metric. So there's five million, or I'm sorry, two million total trips, five million visitor days, and one million unique visitors, and that's up 23 percent. Describe again what a unique visitor is. A unique visitor is an individual who comes to our community within that time period, in this case a calendar year. So one person, one visit. Visitor days is how long they stay in aggregate. Total trips is how many trips are made. So unique visitors are individuals who come to our town during that time period. They don't count twice, they count once. 
look at the demographics, um, it's not particularly surprising. We're very strong on the 45 to 64 year old in age, and that's held pretty steady if we look from 21 to 22. Uh, second biggest age group is 25 to 44. It's almost the same, if not a huge statistical difference between those two. And if you look at those as an aggregate, that's somewhere around 60% are 25 to 64. And that again is held pretty constant year over year. Uh, if we look at income, uh, by far the largest is in the 50K and less category. So uh, relatively modest incomes or median incomes are seen there with the second largest income um, category being the 100K plus. So it's kind of a bimodal distribution where we have average income and some higher income as the primary uh, participants in those demographics. And that's held pretty steady year over year. How, how does the world of sports impact all these numbers that we're seeing? Because you would, when we talk about single days, are we talking about people coming to see a central high school football game? So they're traveling from wherever to here, see their son or daughter play? We look at play. basically an 80-mile radius. And if it comes from outside that within a given day, it counts as a visit. We can set that and change that, but that's kind of what we picked. Uh, it has a big impact. Uh, sports have a big impact. And I think uh, when you look at the family size, uh, household size, um, you know, you can kind of probably pick out the three to five is probably that kind of family day trip for a sports event for a kid. So yeah, it's a, it's a big part. And uh, what we're seeing again is a lot of them don't spend nights, but they do come and spend money. So we do like to see them visit. So it's an interesting, interesting set of data. Uh, education level, high school is primary, ethnicity, white is primary, and that's pretty robust year over year. So we're going we're to continue to uh, look at these numbers, and we can take these same kind of metrics and more and look at much more specific areas than the city in general. So we can look at what's going into Shannon Hospital or Miss Hattie's restaurant or whatever, and we can determine what kind of draws those various businesses have, who's going there, what their age group is, what their relative income level are. And we can use this for two purposes. Um, one is to assess our effectiveness of our marketing efforts, and two is to understand where our market trends are going so that we can further target those key market segments or pick up some of the market segments where we may be lagging behind in terms of some focused attention. So we're big metrics people. We want to make sure we're measuring the effectiveness of every public fund dollar that we spend, and this set of tools will give us the ability to do that in ways we've never had before. Since you're planning on trips to Canada and Mexico, where do we see statistics that say Canadians <coughs> and people from Mexico are coming to visit San Angelo that would justify those trips? I don't have that for you now, but it's certainly searchable using the services that we have. We can look at the international load and where they're coming from. I just don't have that for you today, but I assure you we will be watching that for the effectiveness of these campaigns. And, the how, and again, how, does, how do we make a decision about Mexico and Canada versus, for example, Colorado, California, Arkansas, in terms of well, in who's both, coming here? In both cases, we're piggybacking on Travel Texas, so we get a sub substantial cost benefit in terms of sharing those costs with those events, with, those, with that entity. And to go as an independent entity to some of these larger states is a, is a considerably larger investment. Not one that we wouldn't necessarily make, but we are afforded this opportunity and we're taking it for this year so far. And we'll be watching those numbers very carefully now that we can do that. We have had some good meetings already this quarter, um, and we have some in the pipeline. As I said before, we have 74 meetings on the books so far, and that's as opposed to 60 in total in 2022. So we are making progress there, and we are continuing to see that pipeline build, and we're working hard, obviously, to get that number back to where it was pre-COVID. And we are, in all honesty, off from our numbers pre-COVID, but we are moving and trending back towards those, though the mix is looking a little different. We're going to be reimagining our visitor center. I'm very excited about this set of projects. I think it's overdue. Uh, we will be resu uh, resuming the sale of merchandise at the, uh, at the visitor center at the chamber. Um, 
in April. Yep, April 23. We'll be fo focusing on locally produced products and other branded San Angelo merchandise. Uh, I think this is something that we've been missing. There's not a great place to buy this kind of stuff in San Angelo all at one place, so we'll be providing that as part of this upgrade. We're also going to be looking at doing a uh, redecoration of the visitor center to include locally produced mural. We're going to have a mural competition where we're going to actually have artists compete to do the mural on the back wall. I think it'll really refresh the place and give our local artists a good boost. Also leverage our visual arts capital status um, through a lot of publicity that we'll do around that. We're going to be looking at doing a whole series of new displays that focus and highlight our various key institutions in town, including Goodfellow Air Force Base, ASU, Howard College, Shannon Health, and others. So we want to make sure that our visitor center isn't just brochure racks. Um, we want to make sure that the visitor center really highlights all the great institutions that make San Angelo a great place to visit. Is the visitor center open on Sundays? It is. Yeah, it will continue to be open on Sundays, the hours. I think, I think it's... 10 to 4, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, we will be open on Sunday, as we have been. And we're also going to do uh, city events. Uh, we're going to have a uh, artist of the quarter. So we're going to have some draw of that, you know, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the local citizens into the, into the visitor center uh, in order to have them have the ability and the uh, opportunity to use that phenomenal facility and uh, get some education themselves in terms of what's great going on so they can go pass the word to visitors who come to our town as ambassadors. Uh, so uh, it's going to be very, very exciting. Uh, I've always seen that facility as being a huge asset to our community, and we're going to work very hard to make sure it optimizes its potential in 2023. It's time to train our hospitality folks. Um, I had an experience, and we've shared this, uh, where I was picking up my luggage at uh, the airport, and I was overhearing the, uh, the uh, counter host at the Avis Rent-A-Car, and he said, uh, he was asked, where's a good place to go to eat in town? His response was, we don't really don't have any great restaurants here. Um, I immediately stepped in uh, and helped that visitor. But that po points out um, with our relatively dynamic hospitality staff here in town. A lot of people come in from out of town. A lot of people take the jobs. They don't know what's going on in San Angelo, and they're not able to communicate that as a result. So we're going to have a campaign where we start reaching out to our hoteliers, restaurateurs, and others, and offer training to their folks in terms of what's going on in San Angelo, what the great tourist locations are so that they can start passing that on. And at the same time, we're going to continue our work with Howard College on a training and certification program for hospitality professionals. I guess that's me, huh? Just ignore it. <laughs> so it's important that we always put our best foot forward with respect to how we interact with our visitors at all levels, and we're going to focus on that. Are we making sure that we use the earned media information that we have for educational purposes? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think that our earned media is one of our best credentials and our best uh, qualifiers as a visiting place, and we certainly want to take fullest advantage of the great uh, designations that we've achieved through that process. Does that mean we're going to have a postcard or something that people can give to people, or how are we, how are we doing that? Because the turnover is high in those right. industries that you just talked about, so you can do a training class, but one month later somebody's new we, we do have to have desk, a, a, and so yeah, it's we, an ongoing process yes, yes, we we'll have appropriate collateral to leave behind and put in key locations we do have rack cards that we do distribute we distributed 180,000 through not only Texas but the shoulder states in 2022 uh, we will use a similar concept up to date with the latest and greatest visit locations to not only have for local distribution but for regional and shoulder state marketing efforts and I just want to bring you up to speed quickly with our recruitment process for the new VP of the DMO. Um, I want to say right up front, we're about two months into it. Diane left at the end of 2022. Um, we have established a search committee, um, and we will be uh, working with that committee to make the best choice possible for the city 
Uh, the search committee uh, has representatives from all key constituencies uh, on board so that we get a voice from them as key users of the services of the DMO as far as what the leadership of the DMO should look like. And this includes restaurants, hotels, uh, SAPAC, um, Museum of Fine Arts, and, and many others. So it's going to be a collaborative effort. Uh, the selection will be informed through that effort, and um, I'm very uh, pleased with the level of response that we're getting from the market in terms of candidates. We've got a great internal candidate, and we have some external candidates that we'll be looking at. I'll be cutting off the application process at the end of February. We'll begin the uh, narrowing down process early in March and start the formal interview process probably toward mid to end of March. We'd like to get this position filled, but I assure you we're going to be very deliberate and make sure that we get the best fit and the best possible person for this position. So I'm pleased with how that's going. I'm anxious to get it done. Um, being acting DMO is a lot of pressure, uh, but I have learned a ton, and I'm very honored to be working with a great staff of people who are very passionate about doing a great job here. So with that, I'll leave it up to your questions. Talk to me about the social media growth, there, uh, the numbers that you reflected. How does that relate to the previous year? So is it more than, less than? We, we've How seen, do we evaluate that? Yeah, we've seen positive trending, and I probably could have engineered that slide better to show that. But across all of our media platforms, we've seen positive growth. And I've been particularly impressed with the growth we've seen with respect to the new website. Uh, those numbers have been quite, quite strong in terms of visits and in terms of all the other metrics associated with the website. So I can, I can follow up, and I will in subsequent meetings with more precision around those trending uh, uh, data for uh, social media. And uh, should have done that this time. Apologize for that. On your print media, which I'm a print media person, talk to me about the effectiveness of the ads, for example, in Texas Highways, which I think is one of the best magazines out there, particularly um, for travel. So. Um, are we getting good response from Texas Monthly, Texas Highways? Where are we getting the best response in print media? You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to uh, attach a marketing effort to result uh, directly. Uh, but what I can tell you is that those are primarily drive market publications. And what we've seen as a kind of high line is, as we saw in the statistics that we now have, drive is high. Day stairs are high, higher, and by significant margins. And so one could surmise that the print media there had a positive effect there, and I think that's pretty robust. And we're going to continue to look at our spend in those areas with respect to the specific numbers we see coming, and we're going to establish more correlations there, and, and we'll make those investment decisions accordingly. Because it is called the Destination Marketing Organization today, what percent of the total budget is being spent on actual marketing? Um, as it sounds right now, it's about 50%, um, give or take, but that's, that's, that's right about where we're at with respect to marketing spend versus uh, staff and overhead. Is that up or down? Well, with the, with the pullback of the budget, it kind of depends on how we are bonused. Uh, we have, as you will recall, uh, three bonusing periods for $60,000 uh, over the course of the year. Um, I'm anticipating that we'll earn those budgets, and if that's the case, then we will be growing our spend in terms of the marketing versus overhead. Uh, if we don't, we'll, we'll be right where I told you we are. Because with it, I'm just destination marketing organization, I want to make sure the focus and a large percent of the budget is actually into marketing. It's very important, um, and uh, we certainly have maintained a consistency of that over my period of time here. And uh, we will strive to continue to maintain that consistent uh, mix of, 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 of budgetary priorities. I think going to conventions is nice. The question mark is what is the productivity of conventions and making sure that the dollars spent produce uh, results in terms of people coming and staying in our hotels because it's hot tax money paying for it all. So we need the growth in hotel uh, stays to continue to grow because if our budgets start to decrease because of the diminishing hot tax money that impacts everyone. No, absolutely the case. Um, we're very uh, 
aware of that. We watch the star reports. We now get them weekly just to be able to further get those metrics in front of us so we can track that with more precision and more frequency. Um, we're with you in terms of those priorities and uh, we will be running our program in 2023 in consistency with what you're Even saying. Even though we changed the name, the reality is Convention Visitors Bureau is the focus of hot tax money and we need that to continue to grow. Indeed it is and one of the things that it was encouraging is we're seeing average daily rate going up and that will contribute proportionally to the hot tax in a different way. We'd like to see the occupancy up and uh, we're continuing to, to monitor what that looks like. Uh, drive market is encouraging and it's what we anticipated when we got into the COVID pandemic. We figured that was our way out in terms of recovery is to drive, push the drive market because that's the easiest one to recapture. I think we've done a good job there. Clearly, we have to work to make up the deficits we're seeing through a reduction in business travel with more leisure travel and that's where you're seeing the investments being made. Other questions? Yes, Tom. So, Walt, and you may not have this answer ready today, um, and if it's not, that's fine. So, the data, Datafy that you're using, that data set, as far as working on geofencing, how quick can you set up a geofence for an event? So, do you pre so like if somebody called you today and said, hey, there's an event going on next week or Thursday, do you have the ability to set that up locally, or do you have to call and have somebody set it up? How quick do we do a geofencing analysis on Datafy? There's a number of points of interest already set up in the system. So the likelihood that you we would need one off the fly is next to zero. If there is a new point of interest that comes up, it's a matter of uh, us feeding that in from those geolocations to the company and they could get them set up rather rapidly. Right, so the dashboard is somewhere else. You just send them the metrics you want and they work the dashboard. Correct. Okay, cool. No, it's, 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 so here's where I'm going with that. There's events that go on and there's people here in private industry that would love to have those metrics. You have the ability to provide those and you could probably charge for those too if it was a reasonable fee and those people looked at it. I was just trying to see if that was a way for you to help justify and pay that because there's many individual events that we would like to know, did that pay for itself or did it not? And even the people that put it on. I mean, there's events at the lake, the rodeo ground, not specifically Stock Show and Rodeo, but there's several individual events. And if you could dial it tight enough with those geofences down to a mile radius or whatever, it'd be yep. interesting to see that data. But I anyway, think that's, that's an awesome idea. One we'll certainly explore. Uh, we are working to understand the full capabilities of the system and the, and the, and the uh, investment we're making. Uh, we have 585 points of interest identified within San Angelo already. So we went pretty aggressive in terms of getting everything possible we could in there. We can also do a geographic uh, multiple site kinds of analysis. Can you subcategorize them, for example, I'll say all sports events over here or lake events over here or we can, we specific can look at, categories yes, so you see the impact not of a single event but the combination of all those events in that category because Things like weather can impact at one event versus another, so the categories would seem to be very important. If, it, if, it's, if it's tied to a physical location, and most sports events are tied to a physical location, be it the sports fields or be it at the rodeo or wherever, we can look at that geo-fenced geo area during any time period or any aggregation of time periods and see who was there and what their demographics look like. So it's, it's a very powerful tool. And we are already working on some projects as a kind of getting to, used to doing those uh, for a number of different entities in town already. I think your idea of charging some modest cost recovery there for the value of that data is something worthy of analysis. And I think probably very, very probable that we, we could look at doing that. If you don't geofence Blaine's pub, we're good. All right, well. I'm not. Say I, that again. That was kind of mumbling through at the microphone. I don't think you want us to hear that. Geo fence, Blaine's Pub, we're all good. <laughs> Just to be clear. Just to be clear. Just to be clear. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of the technology, but if it's available, I'm going to use it. And I think we will see. We're going to understand our market here better than we've ever, ever understood it, and that's really, really important to connect those dots that we're talking about between investment and result. And that's what we're really all about. We want to make sure every public dollar that's spent is spent wisely and effectively towards the fulfillment of our mission. And I assure you we're going to continue to work on that. And I look forward to uh, future quarterly presentations to tell you how we're doing. 
and uh, make ourselves accountable to you all uh, in terms of the investments we're making on behalf of our community. It's one of the single largest organizations that we fund, so we need to make sure that it justifies the expense. We invite the scrutiny and we appreciate the partnership. We appreciate the support and uh, we're really looking forward to an awesome 2023. So thank you all so much for your service and uh, we're always at your disposal at the Chamber of Commerce. Any other questions before I move on? We're good. All right, thank you all. We will now move in to item B, consider resolution of general support for construction of affordable housing project as part of, oh, Oh, okay, so we will stop and go back to the tiers presentation. Thank you. Uh, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, I'll go through this quickly. This is just a list of all the projects, but I've got slides for each one, and then I'll have this summary again at the end, but this just shows all of the projects, and these are in the north tiers, uh, the requested funding amount, and then the recommended funding amount. So the first project is at 2626 20, North Chadburn. They requested $75,000 in funding. Uh, after reviewing the request, only 72,681 were eligible expenses. Uh, and given that they're required to do a 10% match, uh, that meant that their recommended incentive was 65,000. Uh, that's for facade improvements, paving, uh, fire systems, uh, fee reductions, secondary egress, as well as asbestos abatement. This is a picture, uh, the before of what it looks like now, and then the after. It's proposed for a new Donatopia uh, there on the north side. Um, and feel free to stop me if you have questions about any of these, but I'll just kind of go through them quickly. Uh, the oh, yeah. I'll just say maybe we need to geofence that and see if how much Tom goes there. This next item is 1,000 uh, North Chadburn, uh, requested 59,000 with their 5,900 match. Uh, the recommended incentive award is 58,000. Uh, this one's for paving, uh, facade improvements, landscaping, and screening. And you can see some pictures here. It's um, of, of what it looks like now. And then the proposal uh, is for a new building as well as uh, some fencing and screening of that outdoor Where's the landscaping? Uh, outdoor storage. It doesn't show here, but they'll they'll provide more details on the landscaping um, as part of the project. That's something that we typically... We require landscaping if we do parking lots. Uh, yes, we would typically do that, yeah. Uh, and in this case, they have proposed landscaping. We just don't have the, the uh, renderings of it here. Now, these next four are all uh, in the 900 block of North Chadburn. It's a shopping center, uh, and so each of the four separate business slots within the shopping center uh, are requesting funding. Um, and so I won't read through all the numbers here, but uh, basically all of them are in the neighborhood of 75,000. A couple of them are less than that. Uh, the ones on the end, each end of the building, are including facade improvements on the sides, and so theirs are a little more expensive than the two interior slots. Uh, but again, it's mostly facade improvement and landscaping installation. So 901, 903, 907, and then 909 uh, North Chadburn. Uh, this is, you can see here, the shopping center, uh, you know, with four individual spaces there. And you can see the side of the building. That's what it looks like today. Um, it doesn't show up real well, but it includes some rock facade and basically facade improvements to, to improve the, the exterior uh, appearance of the building. And you can see here, it's a little hard to see again, but the, the rock uh, uh, on the bottom and then uh, redoing the top with like a stucco type uh, finish on the top. That's the side of the building. We have okay, so two things. One, um, are there businesses that we know are going to go into these? I th we're excited to see that strip mall, I guess you would call it, um, redone. It's, um, it's, it's exciting to see someone's going to take that adventure on. Um, are they doing it without knowing who's going to go into those separate entities? Or we're redoing it and then hoping someone... Um, signs a lease. 
It, their their narrative uh, description in their application does not say whether or not they have um, uh, identified tenants. Uh, we encourage the applicants to be here. I don't know if any of them are here today. Um, they may be able to answer that, but they did not give us that information. And then because there is art on the building, what happens to the art? That's a good question. I, uh, at this point, I don't know. Given the renderings that they showed, I would suspect that that would be covered up. Um, but I don't, I don't know that for sure. But, but based on the drawings they submitted, uh, they would be adding rock you know, along the bottom and then refinishing the top. So they may have plans to replace that art with, you know, redo it or do something different, uh, but that was not part of their application. Well, it's exciting to see someone taking this project on. I'm, I'm really excited about it. That's great. Good. Uh, this next one is 2,600 MLK, uh, requested 66,000 um, for outside storage, paving, and facade work. Um, and again, you can see here, this it's kind of a storage yard, and they're wanting to improve that um, with some fencing uh, and improvements to the building as well. Uh, this sort of metal pa uh, R panel type fencing uh, would screen all of that outdoor storage. That is something that we've talked to a few businesses on the north side and uh, we, what came out of our town hall meetings as well as some of our staff drive around in that area, uh, we identified screening of some of that outdoor storage a as a high priority item that could really improve the ap appearance of the area because there are a lot of uh, open lots that either don't have fencing or they have chain link fencing and so all of that uh, stuff that's stored on the site is is very visible and and is not always as attractive as it could be and so some uh, screening of that with opaque fencing uh, is helpful and so it's good to see we've got two or three applicants that are proposing to do that so this is back again to the summary I'll note that that we did have a project for 1720 MLK uh, that was for a church uh, as you may recall, the policy currently allows a nonprofit organization to apply for funding, um, which they did. The policy also requires a three quarters majority vote of the entire board as well as the entire council. Um, that tiers board only has not, or they have nine members. Uh, at the meeting, there were only seven present, and this church uh, proposal got six votes, so it was a six one vote. However, to hit that three quarters majority of the entire board, it required seven votes. When does it go back to the board to exclude nonprofits? Uh, that will be at their meeting. Uh, it was actually on their schedule for this past meeting, but their meeting went long and we had members had to leave, so they didn't get to that item. They've carried it over to their, to their February meeting, so uh, that'll be here, I think, next a week from today, I believe. Uh, and so they'll be taking that up. Um, I think this council believes strongly that nonprofits should not have the right to apply. If you don't put money in, you don't get to take money out. Sure. Now, just just so you're aware, this um, they are uh, reconsidering this at their next meeting, uh, hopefully with a full uh, board to see if it would get sufficient votes. Um, you, you always have the ability to deny it based on, on what you just said, but because they did apply when nonprofits were eligible, it will still have to go through the entire process. But it, that is not before you today. And then we had uh, three projects in the south tiers, um, and I'll go through each of those. The first one is 109 South Chadburn. They requested 75,000, um, and the recommended incentive was 75,000, the full amount, for facade improvements, fire system, uh, egress, as well as historic preservation. Um, it had been approved for fire sprinkler uh, in 2022, uh, and so this is basically coming back to kind of finish the project largely with the exterior work uh, to the building. Have they gotten the, the – because they've been ready to open for a while, right? And then the fire sprinkler system is at the building that they yeah, haven't been able to open because that we didn't have the – fire sprinkler system? No, they, they actually received funding last year for the fire sprinkler. I'm not sure if they've completed that or not, uh, but they have already uh, been approved that funding. And so this is based primarily the exterior facade. They had requested both uh, last year. Uh, given the limited amount of funding in the South, uh, the board recommended 
in fact, at the meeting, they asked the applicant, if we can only fund the fire sprinkler or the facade, which would you prefer? And they said the fire sprinklers. And so that's what was approved last year. And so this year they've come back for the exterior facade improvements. And so that's what's before you today. Uh, and so hopefully- Is there any way we would open them up without, because there's some missing thing with the fire system that has not allowed them to open their doors for business? I'm actually not aware of that, what, what might be holding them up, uh, but presumably this will finish out the project that they've proposed to tiers, and so hopefully that would get them everything they need uh, to be ready to open. And again, this is the what the exterior would look like after uh, the renovation. The next one is 213 and 215 South Chadburn, uh, requesting 75,000. However, this was another one that the eligible costs were only 65,000. Uh, and then in the South, it's a required 25% match, resulting in a total award of 49,000. Uh, I'll just note for, for your benefit and, and for any applicants that may be listening, um, only eligible expenses can be requested and so we had some projects where they would request as part of their project you know plumbing work and electrical work and stuff inside the building that's just not eligible so that has to be subtracted out because it's it's not eligible per our policy uh, this one is also for fire system asbestos abatement and secondary egress uh, just a note on secondary egress that basically means a lot of these downtown buildings um, don't have a secondary access like out the back of the building for to meet the fire code. And so building that secondary access is an eligible expense. Uh, most, most interior improvements like that aren't eligible, but fire sprinklers and secondary egress are two examples of interior improvements that are eligible expenses. This is the building, again, that's the exterior, but in this case, they're not really proposing anything on the exterior. It's, it's all that interior work for the fire sprinklers, asbestos, and the secondary egress. And then the last project here is 402 West Beauregard. They've requested 75,000, uh, and the total project cost is 250,000. Uh, the recommended incentive was the full amount they've requested uh, for facade improvements, landscaping, fire system, and asbestos abatement. Uh, this is the hotel uh, there on Beauregard. What will be the name? Is it the same hotel that current owned it, or has it sold to somebody new? Or what's I'm, it going to open? What's the flag that's going to fly? I, I'm not sure. It has sold, and so when they applied in the past, they they were using the name Hotel Angoria. I don't know if that's still the name. Uh, or if it has a, an affiliation, uh, but it is under new ownership. You'll note that in your packet, it indicates that the uh, previous uh, owners owed uh, outstanding hotel occupancy taxes. Um, that was not paid as part of the sale of the property, and so that burden does extend to the new owners. And so as noted in your packet, uh, we will not be able to move forward with the agreement with them and, and then move forward with the project until that issue is resolved. So just to make sure they have to be current on their hotel motel tax before they receive tiers funding. That's correct. Now, that doesn't hold the you off on approving it today because we'll hold off on issuing them a letter to proceed until that's resolved. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. This It could delay this project until they get that issue resolved. is kind of a rendering of what it will look like uh, afterwards. Um, Where'd you find those pictures of those cars? <laughs> this is from the applicant, so I'm not sure where, where they got that, but you can see it is making some improvements. We don't need a used car lot. <laughs> and it will have this uh, pool area in front that's, that's right here with some landscaping, and then you can see the trees landscaping along the front of the building as well as well as all the facade improvements. So again, that's a summary of uh, the tier south. I will note that um, the recommended total funding for the south is 199. Uh, there's currently 265 available. Uh, so that if you approve all of these as, as recommended by the board, there will be about 66,000 remaining for future projects. Uh, so we will have another cycle coming up in a couple of months 
Uh, we do know there are some projects already. In fact, we had some applications for projects that had to be rejected because they did not yet have the DHRC approval that's required. Uh, so we know that there's at least two or three projects that will be resubmitting for that. Uh, but as in the past, there likely will be more requests for funding than there is funding available. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any further questions from council? We're all excited about the, uh, the way the North is now jumping on this, and I think it uh, reflects, reflects very well on the future. I wasn't going to bring this up uh, except the subject was broached in terms of the tiers, but I would wish that uh, there would be a component addressing ADA requirements on the application. I know of at least one of these facilities that has a relatively severe problem with, uh, with ADA. That can be solved very quickly, but I wish it could be part of the application on those areas that are, are being affected by the, the request. I mean, I'm, I'm certain based on the fact that some of these buildings are 75 years old, that there's an internal problems, size of bathrooms and the whole litany of things. Uh, but as long as their request for tears has nothing to do with that, you know what I mean? I don't see the sense in jumping in on a 75-year-old building and, and saying, well, you better tear down the bathrooms because they're not big enough. Uh, that's, I think, to be addressed in another, another way. Yeah, and that's typically how we would treat it. But if, the, if they are touching it, uh, then through our, typically through the building permit process, uh, they have to indicate how they're bringing it into compliance. But if it's an element that they're not touching, then typically they wouldn't have to. Uh, now, I will say that there have been projects in the past um, that the Tiers Board has recommended additional improvements. So, for example, we had one on the north side two or three years ago. Um, they had not planned on doing any sidewalk work, and they had not asked for the full amount. And so the board said, hey, we'll add, you know, ten or $15,000 to your award if you'll repair the sidewalk and create the ADA curb ramps and, and all of that. So uh, that is something we try to look at, but it's probably something we'll be doing more so in the future. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Harry. Since I've been on this particular council, traditionally the south zone is doesn't have near as much money. And I'm wondering if there's a way to extend the south zone or bring more businesses in or whatever that needs to do to increase that amount of, of dollars that we've got in the south zone? Well, the number one thing is is um, the number of buildings that go from taxpaying people to nonprofit status. That's our biggest hiccup. And you, the more that happens, and it's been happening a lot, the more it impacts this funding. So that's number one. You probably recall just a couple meetings ago, this council asked us to take to the board uh, moving, looking at moving the north-south boundary, um, and that's also going to the board later this month. Um, and so that would add at least some. Uh, well, I, actually, that's going to take some out uh, of the south and put it in the north. So it doesn't address your concern. No, it doesn't. Uh, it it gets, takes money from the north to put in the south. Uh, right, right. It gives more money to some of those south areas, but it uh, it. We, we struggle all the time now with the south tier zone and I'm just I'm just looking at if there are ways that we can add more businesses to that zone to increase some of the funding now I also know that a good number of those buildings uh, in the south zone are utilizing what we've got because they are not in good repair so Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, Harry. Buy a building, open up a business. <laughs> That'll help. And apply for funds. <laughs> Thank you. Any other fur further questions or comments? I just wanted to make a comment. I, I Like uh, Larry just said, I'm really glad to hear that these uh, north side business people are actually coming and applying for the funds, and I hope they continue to do so. I think what we'll want to do uh, later on this spring season is have another town hall meeting because I think having the ability to showcase um, these projects might entice other people to look at their property and do it. So 
Uh, I think we need to continue with the town hall meetings. We need to continue with uh, walking door to door. We need to make sure that the pamphlet that we talked about is in Spanish so people understand it. Those things were all things we committed to in the town hall meetings, and I want to make sure that we continue with that and don't just stop um, because another year came and went. So that, that process has to continue. Okay, thank you. So may I have a motion to approve item to approve. D? Uh, Lucy made a motion to approve second. item D, seconded by Karen. Any public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. With none opposed, motion passes seven to zero. We will now move into item B, consider a resolution of general support for construction of affordable housing projects as part of the 2023 annual low income housing tax credit or the LIHTC program for the project Roosevelt Lofts by OPG Roosevelt Lofts Partners LLC, who is, um, going, is here with us today. April Engstrom is here today and Del Velasquez is also here today. So, um, Bob, you're on, I guess. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, now, we usually have several tax credit projects vying for uh, Council support in the form of, in forms of resolutions, uh, but this year we only have one. It is the proposed project by OPG Roosevelt Lofts Partners LLC, and the name of the project is Roosevelt Lofts, located at 50 North Chadburn. And of course, um, as you all know, that the city's resolution uh, support to a resolution carries a lot of weight in the state uh, scoring system. So we certainly want to support some uh, similar uh, projects. Anyway, we have Miss um, April Instrum uh, from the company that's here to give you a short presentation, and she'll be glad to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Thank you. April. Hi, thank you for having me this morning. Um, so I'm here to talk today about Roosevelt Lofts, which I'm uh, feeling pretty excited about. Um, but first I wanted to talk about Overland Property Group, our firm uh, first, to give you some background. Uh, so Overland Property Group was founded in Salina, Kansas about 20 years ago. I guess it'll be 21 years uh, this year. And since we've branched out from Kansas into Colorado, uh, you know, Oklahoma, Missouri, um, but our largest footprint is actually in Texas. So this is where we spend most of our um, time and development efforts. Uh, we really like to keep everything um, kind of in-house. So we manage every step of the process from site selection all the way to, you know, working the budget, uh, submitting the applications for funding, um, working with our lenders and investors to close on debt and equity. And then we oversee construction and work with our management company. We have an in-house asset management division um, who oversees our third-party management company, um, just to ensure that everything is always running really well. We like to run a tight ship. Um, and so it's, it's part of our business model to, um, you know, develop these buildings and communities and then to keep them. So we're not just developing to sell, to make a quick buck. When we come to town, we want to establish a working relationship with the city, a friendly relationship with the city. It's important to us because we want to be here. We plan to be in these cities for the next... 30, 40 years, you know, we don't, um, we don't develop to sell. Uh, we've won some awards for our work over the last 20 years, um, some of which have actually been in our historic preservation work. So we specialize in housing tax credits, but starting in 2015, we started working on historic rehabilitation. So that has you working with housing tax credits, historic, federal and state tax credits. Um, and I just wanted to sh run through some of our um, completed historic deals. We have four that are up and running at this point. We have two that are under construction um, and then a couple other that are in the preliminary stages, pre-development stages. Uh, so this is Landmark at Lamar in Wichita Falls, Texas. This is actually in their downtown as well. Um, it 
finished uh, construction had people moving in in 2019, and that is 30 units of senior affordable housing. Here are a few after pictures. Um, Wichita Falls is, I think, pretty close to exactly the same size as San Angelo. Um, and I know that they came to be super fans of this project because it had a real impact on their downtown as a whole. Uh, this is Lee Lofts in Salina, Kansas, where the first floor is actually our um, Salina, Kansas office. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects. When I started working at Overland Property Group, we were officed across the street, and I think we had just applied for um, tax credits for funding for this deal, and I could see the building just like right out my office window. Um, and then I found the keys one day, like after we acquired the building, and I was able to go and explore and take photos, and it was, um, pretty much our closest to Roosevelt Lofts that we've worked with. It was just a shell, mostly, um, just wide open spaces. Um, and this is what it looks like today. So it was really um, kind of inspiring for me to watch this <clears throat> come to life over the course of you know my first couple years at Overland Property Group. And this is also in Salina, Kansas's um, Sorry, this is also in their downtown. It's on the north end. So this block had like um, a bar uh, and then some abandoned warehouse buildings like these ones. Um, it, it was just not a super vibrant part of our downtown. And at around the same time, our downtown was, Ursulina's downtown was undergoing like a big renovation, uh, revitalization project. It took about five years. And this was a key piece in in their efforts, so we're proud of it. Um, and then this is actually our first historic deal, the Tabor Grand Hotel Apartments in Leadville, Colorado, uh, that we did in 2015. I unfortunately wasn't at the company at the time because I would have loved to work on this one. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, we won a couple of awards for this one, which was exciting given that it was our first historic rehab. And this is Stone Post Lofts in Hayes, Kansas, an old school house. And that's a family um, development with 18 units. And that opened just this last year. All right, now about this deal. Um, so, you know, every year we, we do a lot of new construction as well. Um, I personally love historic architecture. I love antiquing. It's one of my hobbies. Uh, so this... Um, you know, is very in line with my personal interest. So every year when we start looking for vacant land, I always want to find the historic buildings because I think that they have a twofold impact on the community. And I like to, um, you know, be as efficient and effective as possible in my work. Um, so I found this one and I thought, yeah, I found some old photos of it too. And I thought it was um, ultimately a really beautiful building. And then I got to talking with Steve, the owner. Well, I think maybe my broker and I talked to Dell first and he introduced us to Steve. Um, but it seems like, you know, Steve really cared about this building, cares about it. Um, he had awesome plans for it. Um, and, you know, in talking with him, you can, you know, we both share a passion for historic architecture. Um, unfortunately, these historic buildings can be a bit expensive when you start looking at all of the um, you know structural issues uh, with your engineers, things like that, they become a big financial lift. Um, so through historic state and federal tax credits, we're looking at you know roughly a little bit shy of three million that we could bring in uh, that we think would we'd be eligible to receive in historic funding, and then we'd be over a ten-year stream, we'd get about twelve ma million in housing tax credits. So you can see how, you know, when you're working with just the historic tax credits, sometimes it's not quite enough and it makes it, makes it pretty tough. Um, but these housing tax credits really allow us to renovate this building, you know, to a really high quality. Um, I think, too, you know, the thing that's tough with these is that they can only sit vacant and unfinished for so long um, while they are assuredly made better um, than a lot of the new construction we see these days. Uh, they just can't last forever. So I know I was telling um, the mayor and Daniel and Dell in our last meeting that 
I checked out a really cool building in um, Lubbock's downtown a couple years ago, and I really wanted to work on it, but our engineer and our architects were like, this, this is so structurally <laughs> far gone that there's nothing, uh, like we wouldn't recommend, it's not feasible. Um, so I think when we're looking at buildings like this and when we care about preservation um, and this historic architecture, it's really important to sort of strike uh, while you can. Um, and these housing tax credits would allow us to do that. Uh, so we are looking at about 25 units. Uh, these would be senior affordable units. Uh, rent range roughly between $365 dollars low end and then closer to a thousand dollars high end they'd be one and two bedrooms between 600 and 900 square feet um, so it's a 6.5 million investment those are our construction costs tentatively but ultimately this would be a have a project budget of about 12 million total and then here's our proposed rents and unit mix um, this is uh, and during the application phase, which, you know, lasts anywhere from like late fall to March 1 when applications are due to the state, this is in flux most days um, because we're trying to really cater the unit mix to the city's needs, um, the, the residents' needs, um, and then finding what, what works. Um, so right now we have uh, 19 one-bedroom units six two-bedroom units and we have I broke out the area median income tiers so we have three units at 30 percent five units at 50 percent and then 17 of the units at 60 percent so the interesting thing about this deal is it um, as Bob mentioned earlier uh, we didn't actually end up having competition in the region which is uh, unheard of I mean I haven't experienced it at least of course I haven't been at this for years and years, but um, that's the first that I've heard of. And when you don't have a lot of competition, the scoring criteria changes a little bit. You have a little more wiggle room. Um, so that's something that I was just talking to your consultant last night about, um, you know, kind of revising that unit mix to be, to cater to what uh, the city city wants the most. So on something like this, you know, we, th we really think that we would be able to fit in um, some market rate units kind of changed the mix around. Uh, the other thing, you know, in conversations, um, it was made clear that the city's preference was for market rate, you know, totally, which I, I understand. Um, the other thing that, you know, we were able to look into and that I talked to the mayor about and Dell and Daniel about was um, exiting the affordability period in year 15. Uh, typically, we hang out in the affordability period for about 35 to 40 years. Um, and that's oftentimes a real big scoring criteria. There's no way around it. Um, it's also just our typical business model that's oftentimes, you know, we'll see that that's what cities want. Um, but with this one, um, you know, there is an option for us to exit the program in year 15. It's about a year long process. So we'd start in year 14, but we are completely committed to doing that. Um, because again, we want to stay in the community. We want to be friends with the community. So it's really important that we're not just, you know, coming in here and just doing something that benefits ourselves. That's not our business model. Um, we want to, you know, do something that works for everyone. Um, so that is something that we would be looking or that we would be pursuing in year 15. You talk about because you were the only ones who applied in this region yeah. um, and we certainly know we want to move towards market rate but the other issue is the number of one bedroom versus two bedrooms sure. with the desire to have more two bedrooms than one bedrooms mm -hmm. with that scoring criteria changed somewhat because you are the only applicant does that allow you to remix the num the one bedroom versus two bedroom Unfortunately not, because that ends up being just a revenue thing. Like if we're only collecting rent for primarily two bedrooms and we're not getting rents from one bedrooms, it makes it operating expense wise, it's just tough. And you know, this is really on the small end of what we'll do a historic deal with just because you do need a certain unit, unit count to have like the financial viability of a deal. Um, and then when you're working, 
you know, in senior housing, those are typically the units that lease is the one bedrooms versus the two bedrooms. So unfortunately, that's the, that's the tough part because we do have to hit a certain amount of units to make the budget work from an operating standpoint. Does your budget incorporate um, the Roosevelt sign? Because that's really important to me that that Roosevelt yes. sign goes <laughs> back up on top. It's yes. Renovated. It's Okay. Yeah, Good. no, that's um, very important to me too. And one of those things that was very exciting to me when I first started talking to Steve. Um, so we've worked it into the acquisition price. Yeah, Steve's awesome too, by the way. He just wants to see this building. He cares. He's been very committed and yeah. has been very disappointed that he hasn't been able to make it happen. So yeah. we're glad that you all were talking mm -hmm. and yeah. came to some positive conclusions. Yeah, he's a, I, you know, it's always fun to chat with people who um, who have a passion for, for this kind of rehabilitation. Um, so right here, I have just a couple of conceptual unit floor plans. Um, and then I'm not going to, to read all of these out, but I do have just an, an amenities map. Um, you know, as a developer, when I'm looking at a site to develop, it's really important to me that I'm um, trying to develop housing in a place where it makes sense. Where, where there's actual services available. And that's yes. the positive about our downtown area. There yes. are lots of services available in a very small, tight area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that's something that uh, gets me really excited about, you know, the total viability and health of a deal. Um, you know, you just want to you want to do something that makes sense, and this makes so much sense to me from a location perspective. Um, as you know, as Dell knows, because I think I've told him 30 times, I'm a huge fan of your guys' downtown. I think it's really special. Um, so, you know, when I look at the Roosevelt and its location, I think, like, the question I always ask myself is, and for senior housing is, like, would I want my grandparents to live here? Like, would I feel good about them living here? And Make us feel better and say your parents, not your yeah. parents. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My parents. <laughs> they're all, they're young. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, this is a great, great location um, for housing. And then I have my info up on the screen. Um, I like to be accessible. Um, so, anyone can text me, call me, email me anytime. Our address is there too if you prefer to write a letter. Um, but, By yeah. the way, April went to Kansas State University as well, I so I just, I, I, I wanted, if you, if you wanted to ask that question, yes, she did. Yes. Did, did you? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Best yeah. friend did. Yes, we have been to Yeah. I want to say that um, April has been very open to the questions and challenges that we put before her and working with her company to make sure that we believed in the long run that this project addressed the needs and the wishes of where we see our downtown going. And they have uh, committed to do as much as that as possible. They have to um, obviously live with the rules and regulations attached to um, these tax credits, but they know their business and they know how to get these projects done. And the uh, slides that she has shown in conversation with individuals in those cities, they've been very very uh, supportive and very proud of the pro end project and the success in terms of really helping to drive their downtown revitalization. So I am very supportive of this and I feel it's in the best interest of our city to stand up and stay strong in supporting this resolution. Thank you so much. Other questions or comments, Karen? I have three questions. Let's hear them. Um, adequate parking. Yep. Um, so that's something that, you know, we're looking at. I mentioned it in our last meeting, and we'll talk with planning and zoning about it. Um, we hit the ADA requirements for parking. Um, you know, I was just looking at the survey, I think, like, a couple days ago, and it looks like there's um, an alley that will be under our ownership that we didn't realize was going to be part of our ownership. Um, so that's something that, you know, during the building permit approval process that we'd want to work with. The I think we'd already went before, I think we already uh, did a quick claim on that. Oh, okay. So okay. you need to check on that, but I Perfect. think that was part of some of the previous work done was a quick claim on additional real okay. estate to get the parking. 
And okay, okay, so that's why that was done. I saw that on the title work, um, yeah. but I wasn't sure. Yeah, we've already done that. Okay. Cool. Um, retail or other tenants on the mm -hmm. ground floor, I think it's important to all of us that we have quality street sure. businesses. Sure. Um, and so per, uh, related to that is how will the property be managed? How do you ensure that you have quality tenants on that ground floor, Lux even luxury tenants? Oh, yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, the housing tax credit program is no joke. Um, so, you know, when I went to rent my apartment, I was verified in a day. Uh, this is like a two-week verification process. Uh, you can't have any felonies. You can't, there, there are a lot of um, <laughs> okay. stringent rules um, and checks that, that we do. And something like this with 25 units, you know, we have, we won't uh, be scrambling to fill vacancies. Um, so we'll only be, you know, selecting the best tenants or the ones who fit the stringent criteria. We also have an on-site leasing manager and maintenance man. Um, so the property will be, you know, managed locally, managed you know, lo locally and staffed every day. So um, your other properties that are similar in profile to this proposal, are they fully occupied? Um, I would have to check on current occupancy. Um, but I can look into that and get back to you. And Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Are you asking if there are other tax credit projects here in San Angelo? No. No, she's talking oh, about the yeah. other cities. Oh, this type. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, so, you know, and with our investors, we have to keep a certain threshold or else we get put on a watch list. That's the other <laughs> thing, too. When you have housing tax credits, you're very heavily Everyone's audited. Everyone's looking at you. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, we have to keep our vacancies high. I think they're usually in the mid, mid to high 90s. Um, but I'll check on our... They would have to be in order for them to financially be viable. They yeah, that's true. They would continue to look at more <laughs> projects if they weren't financially viable. Yeah, yeah that's, that's I, I'm sure true. the mayor knows that I'm very excited as well. She cool. Can, she knows. <laughs> yes, I'm glad I do. to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Lucy, Thank you. you had a question. Yeah, just a quick question, and I might have uh, not heard it. What was the age eligibility for... When do you feel old? <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, sometimes then. You're not now, eligible. Sometimes not. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, it, it varies. <laughs> Typically, it's between, it's either 55 and up or 62 and up. Um, I think usually we end up going with 55 and up. No. <laughs> There's no parking. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm that I say that out loud, my parents yeah. could live Other there. So. Yeah. <laughs> Harry. Just a quick comment, since it's in District 3, yes. I'm glad to see, I support this project, I'm glad Thank to see you. that we're going to move forward with the Roosevelt. Uh, and I do share the, the mayor's enthusiasm about putting the Roosevelt sign back up there, so uh, I, I definitely support this. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? Do I need to take a vote on this uh, resolution? I do I have, oh, Larry, go ahead. Uh, we're interested in jobs. When this thing is completed, what are you talking about in terms of a rough figure of management and everybody involved in? Let me say know. this. It's not about jobs. It's about housing in downtown, and it's about putting dot property tax dollars back into the bank. Because Certainly. those are the two things that we needed to accomplish. Number one, the number one request for downtown is housing, number one. And number two is, as Harry made an allusion to a minute ago, we need more property tax dollars to generate more funds in the tiers fund. And it accomplished those two primary objectives. I'd suggest that if you want housing, then it's got to be people that can afford housing and have a job. So that's my concern is uh, about how many people it's going to put to work in San Angelo. As far as like the development, like not talking about the people who not, live there? Not the construction. I'm talking about the uh, folks that are managing. We would have two local staff members. Okay. So yep. it's not anything large, no maintenance crew or anything like that? No, we would have our, you know, our maintenance guy and then our on-site property manager. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, the maintenance man obviously can't do it all himself. So yeah. then when we need something well, bigger He'd have to be a licensed plumber or a licensed exactly. electrician. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then he has to farm out that work if it needs done. So yep. there's X amount of that. Yeah. But and this hits our two primary goals. 
Yeah. And that's key. Have your experts evaluated the building? You know, those of us that drive by it every day, it's, uh, yeah. you know, they strip the inside down to nothing. And, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so um, we just got our feasibility report back, like, mid last week. Um, but yes, definitely. And that's, I mean, that's obviously paramount when we're talking about a building like this, but the engineering requirements um, and support that we need to show are pretty extensive. So... Yep. Uh, you talked about amenities outside of the building, but are there any amenities inside that you project? Yeah, so we have like, we'll have a community space, um, and then I'd have to look at the plans again, because again, at this time of the year, they're always in flux as we're working towards, you know, it makes the most sense for the building um, in our application. Um, but we have a community space inside, and like a clubhouse, we call them. Um, and those end up being super popular, especially in these senior communities. Um, and so it always ends up being really cool to visit these properties and, you know, see a group of friends who are hanging out in the clubhouse together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times they'll have coffee groups or like breakfast groups or once a week they'll all go out um, in town together, things like that. So without... Uh don't have to mention names, but there's this place called Raw 1899 right across, across the, street the street that I've heard has great wine and some good appetizers. <laughs> a great amenity yeah. close by. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> oh. I have another question. Yes, Lucy. Uh, when you were talking about your other projects, what was the time limit or what's the time limit on this project? That yeah, it like so you mean the timeline for development? Sort of? Yeah, so that's a great question and I meant to address it earlier. So um, I'll start from the beginning. We will apply for funding March 1st. Um, the state will evaluate all applications until their board meeting July 27th at the Capitol. Uh, so July 27th, we'll know whether or not we've secured funding. Right now, we don't know why we wouldn't, seeing that we have no competition. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then from July, um, you know, for the next six months or so, we're working on securing, you know, a debt and equity providers, like a lender and investor, working on the financial feasibility. With a building like this, we're working on the historic approvals process because all of our plans have to go through the historic process. Um, they have to sign off, National Park Service has to sign off on everything. Um, you know, and then we hope to close in January or February of that would put us in 2024. And then construction would be between 12 and 14 months. So then that would put us at, you know, first quarter of 2025. It's, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Larry. One last question. It <laughs> kind of parallels the question that the sure. mayor had about signage. Mm -hmm. On the north side of that building, it's painted Roosevelt Hotel. It's fading. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what are the plans for that? Because, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether we leave it exactly the way it is or do we paint it again? What happens with that? Yeah, so um, I haven't specifically investigated that yet, but as I was sitting there a few minutes ago, I was thinking about, um, I think when you were, someone was talking about the mural project, um, you know, I was thinking about um, ways that we could, could, do something there, um, you know, as far as uh, rehabbing what's there. I love what's there, you know, just to spruce it up well, a little bit. What would be, be determined but is by the Texas Historic and the National yeah. Historic uh, Organizations because they determine what has to be done and what could not be mm -hmm. done. So depending, and that we have gotten in the past, well, Steve Sorrells and Mike Biggerstaff applied for Texas and uh, federal and Texas historic tax credits. So that process has been done one time already. Now, whether that was part of the approval process, I don't know, but I do know this. They were very, very specific about a lot of details, and they will be because it's historic, and that's where they're getting funding. So when they get these tax credits, they have to ma make all of the requirements happen. Yeah, it's no joke. <laughs> um, but I also, too, know a woman in Kansas, so it's Kansas and not Texas, who does, um, you know, historic building, like, repainting, signs like that. 
You have any idea? I'm sure you've been looking at the old photos of the building. What is that below Roosevelt? I can't make out whether they painted a buffalo or the United <laughs> States or what it is. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, you know, the other thing, too, that's really great about this deal is that Steve was using the same historic consultant as us, and her name's Ellis with Polk Oast Preservation. And she's an awesome resource. Um, and at some point in time, you know, it's early on in the process, but um, she usually goes digging, you know, like at the local library or in the archives for historic photos. So I need to touch base with her and, and ask on that. And she did a lot of that when we got the first original tax credit. Yep. So a lot of that work has already been done because they wouldn't have gotten tax credits. Uh, Steve Sarles and Mike wouldn't have gotten tax credits and been approved for it if that work hadn't been done. And they had to work pretty hard to come up with all that information. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, with that, may I have a motion for approval of the resolution? Yes, ma'am. Karen, second it. Harry and Lucy double <laughs> seconded that. So we got strong support. Yep. Any public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Seven zero. Thank, Thank you, you April. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, April. Okay, item C, consider approving amendment number four, South Hanger Taxi Lane with Javiation, a Woolpert Company Master Airport Agreement in the amount of $498,024.37 and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. Jeremy, you're on. Morning, Mayor, Council, Morning. staff. Uh, Jeremy Valgardson representing your San Angelo Regional Airport. Very excited to be here today, and this is kind of an introduction to a project we've been waiting for for quite some time. Um, we do have federal support, and um, this is the design, engineering, and construction management for this project, and I will be coming to you soon for the actual bids and the construction portion of this project. Um, so what this project is, is if you're looking at the picture, this is standing at the precision hangar on the ramp where airplanes park, looking to the west. Um, that's an old access road getting into the ramp that will soon be a 1,000 foot long by 110 foot wide um, taxi lane. Yay. Yes, yay. <laughs> the project consists of relocating a significant amount of utilities. If you name it, it's pretty much with that Just stop. Pavement. Would somebody tell the people in the hall to please be quiet? Thank you. Uh, we're looking at relocating power lines that are above ground, putting them below ground, sewer, water, fire hydrants, telephone, fiber, and the big one is the FAA communications line. We've learned there's some copper lines that are running out to the radar facility and the repeater antennas that will need to be relocated as part of this project. What this project will do is open up development opportunity for four 100 by 100 hangers, four 90 by 90s, eight 60 by 60s, which are all in high demand, and two T hangers, which are in low demand at this point, but we're, we're opening up the opportunity for future development. Can those two T hangers be converted to a 60 by 60? They sure can, yep. And we'll, well, we'll that, get that's that. the demand is for the 60 by 60. Let's not do T hangers. Right. This is just a, a bird's eye view um, of the airport. You can see the red area down Unless there. Unless Tom wants one. I was just <laughs> excited to throw my plane out. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> Development's good. Uh, that, the red section is the, the location of this project, and it is, it is consistent with the master plan. We've made a few alterations from the master plan, but we have full support from the FAA. So here's the layout. The blue area is what we're going to construct. We'll put in the taxi lane, and then we'll, the, the orange and the ramp will be leased by tenants, and they can build to suit. They'll build the hangars that they want that would meet the, the standard specifications, and then they can tie into that taxi lane. There is also some additional work we're going to do with the 60 by 60s. The FAA has agreed that it would be considered public use because the, the hangar furthest to the south would depend on the hangar to the north to get his asphalt in before he could access the taxi lane. So the FAA has agreed to put some additional asphalt in there. Uh, to the mayor's point, you can see the T hangers. The 60 by 60s in the old master plan were actually slated for T hangers, but we had such a big demand for the 60 by 60s, we were able to convert those to that for that use. So same thing can happen with the, the two T-hanger slots. If 60 by 60s is a better use, we can put them in there. 90 by 90s, 100 by 100, we're not limited on, on what we can do in that area. Right. But we will have access to that far west side of the, the airport. Uh, the point of this one, I know it's hard to see on your screen, is just to show all the utilities. Um, 
and I already mentioned it, but we're going to be putting below ground. The big one is that FAA communication line that um, the FAA should pay for, and we're still crossing our fingers that they do. This here is my level of commitment. All the red X's, I have a letter of intent in writing of um, somebody ready to build. So as soon as we get this project done, they're ready to pull a lease. So all the 100 by 100s without any advertisement have already been spoken for. Uh, two of the 90 by 90s and five of the 60 by 60s. And like, again, without any advertisement. When this thing gets advertised and people know about it, they're gonna fill up very quickly. Um, both the FBOs are maxed out on hangar space. We're busting at the seams and I get phone calls uh, almost daily now for do we have any hangars available. Again, we are not constructing the hangars. We are just putting in the taxi lane. So this project, we're recommending that we use Javiation under the master agreement that we have. Um, that master agreement is good for five years. This would be amendment number four. It's design, engineering, bidding, construction, administration. Geotech, uh, cultural and historical, which is already done, testing and closeout. Here's our proposed schedule. We're looking at a March bid advertisement day, so we're coming up really soon on that. Construction award in May, start of construction in July, and project completion in October. I'm pretty confident with these dates because we're also going to run this in conjunction with our um, entitlement project with the South Taxi Lane project to try and get some economies of scale because the FAA is going to require FAA grade asphalt down there on this taxi lane. So we're gonna, if we're gonna run the South Taxi Lane project this time, this will go and it's a very high priority item. Fabulous. Javiation's total fee, um, this is all inclusive. Again, this does include construction management is $498,024.37. Source of funding, it's the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the BIL grant and the Airport Infrastructure Grant, the AIG grant. Um, I put budgeted for in FY23, I do have the, the budget amendment in hand. This wasn't actually, actually an FY22 grant that was carried over to 23 and we will receive another 1043050 for FY23 here probably um, just before September. It is a multi-year grant. Um, for the next five years we'll receive that amount. There is a 10% requirement, so 90% FAA, the rest would be us, and it is PFC eligible. I did do an independent fee estimate. The, for, you, for some of the new council members, I have to do an independent fee estimate because we have a five-year agreement to make sure their fees are fair and reasonable. And then I send a letter to the FAA stating they're fair and reasonable. I get a letter back from the FAA saying, we support it, use our money to pay for it. Um, the independent fee estimate actually came in higher than Javiation's fees, so I did get that letter back from the FAA. This project did go to airport board last week and they fully support it. That'll take any questions. Do we have questions, Tommy? Tom? Yes. So uh, one thing that was pointed out at Precision when we did some construction years ago on the west side of Precision, they had a, and it's shown not included in this, but they used to have a, I would say, a uh, concrete or an asphalt driveway that w allowed them to loop and tow around the back side. Is it worth looking at maybe, while that's not going to be something they taxi on, but at least they could tow their helicopters and things if we were able to take some of this and get that back improved to where the excavators ran over it the last time we did some improvement. Uh, and I know it's not a solution now, Jeremy, but that's been brought up to me several times by several different people. Right, I understand. And I've been looking at that project. That is unfortunately not FAA eligible because it's on leased private land. It's not eligible for public use. Um, but we do need to do something locally as a city and as an airport to take care of that because is it, it is something that we damaged in a project years ago. So, but this, this project will not pay for that. What this project will do is, because we're going to have to amend some of the leases because that taxi lane is going to cut into their lease. It's going to cut into Precision's vehicle parking area. So it will pave an area just a little further to the southwest for the vehicles to park there. And it actually is going to connect to that ramp where they could tow around the west side and still get out to the ramp. Well, helpful. Thank you, Jeremy. Yep. Um, Tommy, did I've you just, have? No, I was, I was going to move approval of, of uh, Amendment 4 for the second. taxi lane. Motion and uh, second. Uh, any public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of approving um, item C, say aye. 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 Motion passes 7-0. Thank you, Jeremy. Get it done. <laughs> item D, receive um, 
receive presentation from Specialized Public Finance Incorporated regarding proposed plan of finance for City of San Angelo, Texas Tax Notes Series 2023 and direct Specialized Public Finance Incorporated to proceed with such plan of finance. You're on, Tina. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to introduce the subject and let you all have a discussion on the projects before we go move on to the uh, funding source that we'll um, propose for you. Um, so the projects are um, approximately $1.6 million for public safety improvements and approximately $303,000 for installation of a traffic light. And here we'll go into a little bit more detail. The public safety um, project is at the animal shelter, and I have asked Morgan and Al Torres to be here if you have any questions on this project. Um, I'll have the slide here, and she can kind of go through the plan. She and he. So if you don't Morgan? Morning. Morgan Chegwood, an assistant director of Neighborhood and Family Services. Uh, what we have before you today Should are. You're talking into the microphone. Yes, I'm hearing it back. Are y'all? Okay. Yes. Um, we have some what I call whole house improvements need, need to happen. Um, the HVAC overall uh, needs a significant improvement, and that's duct work, um, the air handling units, compressors, um, the ex air, air exhaust system um, throughout the building. Um, so that is um, included in this proposal. We also have uh, lighting and ceiling upgrades, really just, so a good bit of my building has um, drop ceiling tiles, um, and then some of it has the flat, like permanent ceiling, um, all of it is holding odor. And so I think that y'all get the same complaints I do, which are about odor, um, noise, um, and uh, standing water in some portions of the kennels, um, drainage issues, plumbing issues. Um, and so that's what's before you today, is to really speak to those complaints and make the building uh, more functional. Um, and the security improvements are something, it's not a security system, it's not any kind of you know uh, burglar or, or anything like that. It's simply functioning doors throughout. Um, my building, I, I joke, my building's full-time job is to use water. Um, and our building is in use every day every minute of the day um, and so we are a building that deteriorates more frequently than an office style building and so literally just the doors throughout are failing and need to be um, changed out so that is um, the kind of the whole house needs um, we are recommending a significant investment in the general population kennels um, that space is really tough for the customer experience um, as well as staff and the animals in care uh, so we are looking at dropping that Ceiling. Right now, it's about 3,000 square feet of 120 kennels. Um, and so that is, if we drop the ceiling and make those five individual rooms, um, that'll decrease noise, decrease odor, um, decrease the um, risk of spread of disease, um, all those things that are really important to us. Um, we also are looking in the general kennels. We'll demo everything. Every kennel's coming down, uh, all the um, cinder block walls, all the chain link gates, all of that's coming down to be reconfigured. And the reason to do that is because we've got to deal with the plumbing. Uh, the plumbing that's... How that's do we... Dra uh, which is great, but what about the animals that are in there now? If we're taking all the kennels out, all the... All, wh where do the animals go? So the logistics of the move out and how much of the building needs to be emptied and for how long um, is going to be discussed early on uh, with the vendor if the council does um, give support of the project. Um, the logistics of moving out, you know, in, in September, we evacuated um, more than 100 dogs out of the building for a pest control treatment. Uh, we evacuated the larger half of the building, about 4,000 square feet of the building um, for that, um, and that was for a short period of time. And so we stood up a temporary location. We leaned heavily on the community. A hundred dogs left from part of that process and never came back net. Either were adopted, kept in foster, um, went on transport, whatever it was. And so we're gonna lean on the community heavily. We also will stand up a secondary location for housing, um, but we'll look for um, guidance from the vendor of how long we have to be out um, so that we can clearly communicate that with our partners and who we lean on um, because this would be like a four to six month um, construction um, timeline for the project to be complete. Um, so we do know that the 120 dogs in the general kennels would have to come out. That building, I mean, that, that room is coming down to, to nothing. It cannot hold animals at all. Um, and so we're, we're, we're going to work through that and um, because we think the improvements are um, that necessary. So, so 
speaking to the plumbing um, in the general kennels um, is significant. Um, expanding the lobby to serve our population. Our lobby has never been sufficient. If I have three people in line at the front desk, it's 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 full. And that was uh, even more uh, made clear during COVID and, and social distancing that we just, we do not have the space really available for um, people. Um, and we're gonna do that through a reconfigure of our cat room. When you first walk in, that cat room will be kind of turned inside out um, so that that lobby is um, better better served to the community. That's the gist of it. Um, so some whole house things and then a significant improvement in the general kennels, which is about half of my square footage. I'm sure we have questions from council. I'll start with Larry. Do you have any questions or comments? Your existing building, when does that date from? This, this facility was uh, constructed in 1999. It's not that old. Right, but it is a building that's used 24 7 365 um, you know if you were looking at other city facilities um, how often they've had a complete rehab they're not facilities not that are occupied as, as, <laughs> as much as mine are um, we, we've got staff there every day of the yeah. year and we're using every square footage um, every day All right Karen uh, tagging on to his question I don't think that building was built for that express purpose initially was it, uh, it was built to be an animal shelter it yes. was okay Lucy? No. Harry? Okay. Tom? I had the same question Larry did, but it's, uh, Morgan, you answered that. It's an outdated facility. It's seen its course. It's run its life. It's got an expiration date on it. I'm glad to see this come forward. Tommy? I've been out there, folks. Yep. I spent a good bit of time out there with Morgan last summer, last fall. I don't know exactly when it was. This is long, long overdue. overdue. We agree. Long overdue. I'd, I'd move approval um, of, of this item. Um, or do we need to do we, it all at one? Well, it's we can one. do this piece and then the other because somebody might be opposed to the other. But um, I think I've heard a lot of positives. I don't hear anybody fighting this. And I think everyone has um, heard enough complaints from the public that we know this investment's necessary and really important. So we're going to go ahead and take a vote on this particular item first. What? In the interest of transparency, just to have an asterisk on that, this isn't going to solve all our problems, right? For the growth that we've had in our community in over 20 years, is this facility even the right size to serve our community? This is just to speak to the existing systems that are approaching failure. It is um, it is going to be living within our current square footage. Um, it's, a, it's an investment and it's needed. Um, but you know, further discussions could occur about, you know, really what would we design from the beginning if we had been at the table in 1999 of what our community needs. Um, so well, we can't look backwards. It didn't happen. But what we do know is the following. The single biggest issues that we have and hear from people is number one, the smell. Two is plumbing. I mean, it, you know, everybody would love to woulda, shoulda, coulda, but where we're at is today. And I think this addresses some key issues that we've all heard from from our constituents. So, um, yes, Heather. This is just a direction item, so you don't have to take a vote, but whenever they're done, just to give direction to proceed with the finance plan. I think that you see seven people saying we, we support this go. strongly, so go. I just wanted to ask her <laughs> yeah. one thing. Hey, Morgan, so what you were saying was that this is not going to be an expansion of, for more animals right we're going to leave it the way it is with the amount of animals that we have now that we're housing all of this is inside our current footprint our current square footage none of this is adding um, square footage adding um, rooms adding space it's in our existing building all right. thank you I think it's important to hear what Morgan said at the very end this doesn't do anything except address immediate needs it doesn't really give us a long-term solution to the to the some of the issues we're having but this has to be done to avoid failure well i think we also need to keep in perspective if we added 60 more kennels we'd still have a problem you can continue to expand it and then you take in more animals and more animals and more animals you're i mean we have to realize at some point we have only certain capacity financially we already spend over a million two uh, funding this animal shelter on an annual basis. We can't keep growing the capacity of the animal shelter. What we've got to do is find answers to solving the animal problem. And that's, 
another conversation. Okay. Another factor, though, too, is that uh, internally, the numbers are going down a little bit, the citations are going up, and that helps to solve some of that overcrowding that we're going to have. Making pet owners responsible, yeah. and we have to stick with the our policies. Okay. Next. Okay. Uh, the next item is the traffic signal um, replacement of the temporary signal signal at Knickerbocker Road and Twin Mountain Drive. Approximate estimated cost of three hundred and three thousand. Um, and Patrick's here. If you have any questions about this one. I think we've heard about this light many times. I heard times. a lot about this, Mayor. <laughs> yes. this so in, have I. <laughs> this is in my district, so I am extremely supportive of this, Patrick. Enough said. That's yeah. it. I like it that way. Thank you all. <laughs> now, are there questions? No, I, 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 I just like driving straight through and not stopping, but I'll go with the crowd. If, are there any questions, honestly, for Patrick? If not, then I think you, again, heard Wait. from this council that that is a project we strongly support, and the citizens will be thrilled. Good deal. Okay, so now for the funding portion. Um, we're looking at uh, reviewing the issuance of approximately $2 million between those two projects and tax notes to fund these improvements. Of course, the note will mature this year in August. Um, it's a one-time funding that's available from the debt service fund. We've built up a little bit of fund balance, so we need to use it for projects. Um, it will not increase the current INS tax rate. There'll be These notes will be offered directly to local and national banks. And I have Vince Vial from Specialized Public Finance here to kind of explain how that process works if you want a little more information. Um, but the bids on the note will be due March 17th and we'll receive the proceeds in April. I think what we like is the fact that the money exists that it will finance the projects. I'm not sure we need a lot more verbiage on it. We need to get these two projects done, and I think it's very, uh, it's great that we found a source of revenue to get these two projects done, so thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, with that, we'll move into item. May, may no. we take a quick Yes, we can break. take a quick break. Let's keep it short. I I've know got Tom's got to go. He doesn't have much time, so when I say 10 minutes, I mean 10 Let's minutes, go. and that means we're Barry. at 1027, Barry. so everybody, don't, let's not linger in the hallways. Fleet hearing of a reconsideration of an ordinance approving the abandonment of approximately 4,060 feet of the right-of-way of Cox Lane beginning near 1861 Cox Lane and extending 2,330 feet to the west, then 1,730 feet south, ending approximately 320 feet north of the intersection of Sunset Drive and Foster Road. John? Thank you. Uh, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, most of you have seen this, but I'm going to go through uh, for those who weren't here, but a little more quickly than last time. But uh, as you mentioned, this is a proposed abandonment of a portion of Cox Lane. And if you're familiar with this area, there's Foster Road that runs uh, right there. And then Cox Lane comes in from Sunset and then runs right beside it until it turns uh, and then goes over. And so it's that duplicated roadway uh, that is being proposed for uh, abandonment. Uh, we did send out notices to the surrounding properties uh, that are immediately affected by that. Uh, 31 notices, nine in opposition that we received. This is just the thoroughfare plan map for the area. So uh, the area we're talking about is, is kind of in here. You'll notice that it's currently outside the city limits as this property looks to develop in the future. Uh, they will be seeking annexation into the city. Um, one of the issues, and I think I've got it on the next slide actually, is um, Park View. I think it's easier to see on that one actually. Park View uh, used to come across from Knickerbocker and come all the way over to YMCA, and then it would continue on. Um, at some point in the past, uh, this piece of Park View was eliminated from the thoroughfare plan, and so that's no longer a continuous uh, collector street. Uh, through there, but the piece that currently exists is still a collector, and the piece that would go through the proposed development uh, would continue that uh, part view. This is Adobe Lane. Most of that does not exist either, but that would be a north-south uh, piece as well, and that will come into play in a minute as we talk about some different options. This is a little bit uh, of a zoom in of that same area, but with the aerial photography, so you can see the existing development uh, and the, the applicants that are requesting the abandonment basically own this piece of land here. 
uh, and are, again are looking to abandon a portion of, of that Cox Lane. I have some traffic counts here. I won't go through all these, but uh, some of the concern, of course, is that if you bring Park View in like this or in some other configuration, that you might increase traffic into the neighborhood, particularly using Park View uh, as a collector street. Uh, I think ba based on this is Sunset, where Cox comes into Sunset and Foster, um, staff's belief is that most of the traffic uh, that comes uh, from this direction will turn south on Foster, either because they're trying to ultimately get to the loop anyway, uh, or they'll go down to Sunset and over. Um, Sunset has no stop signs along the way. It's a pretty straight shot, right? Uh, right. If if you went, if you came into Parkview here, you're going to have to stop. You'd go over to YMCA, stop again, then south to Sunset, and stop again. Um, but I, I think it's it's fair to say that some traffic would probably uh, take those streets through the neighborhood, um, whether it's Parkview or one of the others. Uh, but traffic tends to stay on the major streets uh, when possible, and so that's our belief uh, that long-term that's what will happen. Um, so as I mentioned, staff doesn't believe traffic patterns would uh, be negatively affected. There are uni no utilities that would be impacted by this abandonment, uh, or if there are, uh, they would have to be moved appropriately through the plat process. Uh, and we believe that it would be a public benefit to eliminate those duplicated roads that literally run like 10 feet apart from each other. Uh, that's just an extra uh, maintenance concern uh, for the city having to maintain two roads that, that are literally just a few feet apart. Uh, this is the picture of that Foster Road, Sunset, Cox Lane intersection. So you can see the, the two separate roads there uh, that run parallel. And I should mention that Foster, if you recall on that thoroughfare plan map, it is also a collector street. So it was built and planned long term to be uh, that north-south collector for, for that neighborhood. And this is that corner on Cox Lane. By abandoning this, you would eliminate this uh, somewhat dangerous corner there. And you can see at the time this picture was taken, uh, somebody had gone through the, the guardrails there and... Um, would also be able to you can see here also Foster and Cox Lane that parallel each other you can see that there's an elevation difference so uh, in any future development that would have to be addressed uh, you know if, if roads are going to come in from the vacant property over to, Fo uh, to Foster however this this is about the steepest right here and Cox Lane descends and so in, in just a, a little ways down from this they're basically parallel again little elevation difference. Uh, so the Planning Commission heard this at their December meeting. Uh, they did recommend approval. It was a 5-2 vote, so there were two in opposition. Uh, the recommendations are with a few conditions. These are just our normal conditions with an abandonment that the property be absorbed into the adjacent properties uh, through a plat. Uh, the city would issue a quick claim deed. Uh, there is a unique one with this that's not always on an abandonment but it would basically require that the abandonment shall not be basically affected until replacement streets are created. So there are a few properties that if Cox were abandoned immediately, they would lose any access to a public road. So basically what that means is uh, when development happens on this property, they would have to build the new roads and those roads be open and operational before Cox Lane goes away. Uh, that's a quick overview, but happy to, happy to answer any questions. Uh, there are some slides I'll note. I, I won't go into them because I think the, the applicant uh, will go through them, but uh, there are some options that they wanted to show and, and discuss, but uh, I'll let them go through those slides. Any questions for John at this point? Just his go ahead, Karen. Does the developer's proposal include a, a stormwater drainage study? I'll let them address that, but yes, they okay. have the intention to. of addressing drainage, and in fact, any development uh, of vacant property like this has to okay. prepare a drainage plan and address that through the development process. All right. Tommy? You know, I, I think there's, at least in my mind, there's, there's uh, maybe misunderstanding. I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but what we are being asked today is whether or not we should abandon those two sections of Cox Road. And I think there is some, some 
again, misperception, whatever, that we are approving some design of what this development's going to look like. That's not the case, correct? That's correct. It's only about the abandonment. And and any drawings you see about how roads may or may not be lined up in the future uh, is all just conceptual at this point. That all gets worked out through the development process that's, that's a future. Say, that's a totally separate part, a step in the just in the process that they would have to present to the planning department a conceptual layout for platting purposes of the development, which I think I've learned just through this process, there's some state laws that would say to us, if they present a plan that is acceptable and meets our subdivision ordinances, we have to accept it is that is that what i understand that's correct so we may or may not have a whole lot of say in the ultimate design anyway so i just well, want to yeah i don't think any i think what has come up before is that some of the comments and challenges from neighbors uh, couldn't be addressed because we hadn't seen what a potential development might look like so the idea was t because it's um, it's hard to say you support or don't support if you don't know if there are options to satisfy the issues and the challenges. And so you have to have some plan presented to you from even if it's just a conceptual perspective to say all of those things, including the drainage plan, have to be addressed in the future development. Approving Cox Lane doesn't mean or not that we ignore everybody's issues or challenges um, and you hope that those things can be addressed in the future with what happens in the planning department. But I think it helps address people's questions and concerns and that's what we need to do. Okay, so with that, let's see the presentation, Sherry. Morning Council, Hillary Bucher with Dorado Construction Group. We are representing the owner here. So we will go into our presentation. In the last council meeting, we heard three objectives that you were really looking for. Again, these are conceptual. Well, we heard street layout options, just so you could see all the options and stuff we have considered. We heard drainage patterns and the concerns with the drainage, and we heard about the master thoroughfare plan. So we've come up with some slides to talk about different options. Again, these are all conceptual. We will present the final through the platting process, which will go through the planning division, and then ultimately be approved by the planning commission. So option one is the option you have seen in the past. So this would be Cox Lane turning down to combine with Parkview Drive. So this would create an S curve and combine the two streets. This would create an easy way to flow traffic through our proposed subdivision. So that's one of the original options we looked at. This would provide a two-way stop. We believe at Foster Road, uh, city staff has let us know that that was kind of their plan. So Cox Parkview would have the stop and Foster would be the through street. So that would, I think, help prevent people from making the decision to go through to Parkview. If they are already at a stop, they would probably take the easiest route and turn down south. This also combines the two collectors that are very close to each other into one. So that eliminates the duplicity of some of these streets, again, reducing maintenance costs for the city in the future. In contrast to that, we looked at another option. Again, this is conceptual, but one other option could possibly be taking Cox down to the new Adobe, turning Adobe down, and then having these streets. So this would pr produce probably more stop signs and in some ways slow traffic. Again, we believe there'd be a two-way stop at Foster no matter what. This helps maintain the two separate collectors so they are not connected. But we wanted to make sure that we put this out there as well. Both options have possible additional through streets in future phases. Again, those are not guaranteed. That's why I kind of dashed them in. But the possibility that these other streets can come through and provide alternates, it could really break up the amount of through traffic that, that each street sees. So those are kind of some of the options we looked at in regards to the traffic. So going on to drainage, just to give you a slight overview, this is all very preliminary, so I don't want to go too far into it, but the future drainage study, when we do the full thing, will evaluate the existing conditions and the future efforts needed for the proposed subdivision. 
The goal of this study is to maintain the peak drainage discharge flow rates onto the existing drainage structures that exist today. The detention ponds will be utilized to hold the specified rain amounts that we need that are additional to what is currently out there. And this will ensure the overall impact of the development is minimized and will not change the existing drainage scheme in a global manner. So with the preliminary drainage study that we've done, it's very preliminary, but the existing unimproved site, which is 91.3 acres in a 100-year storm, would release approximately 28 acre feet per 24 hours. So that is using the COSA standard on the unimproved site as it is today. Again, preliminary numbers, we used a mixture of coefficients. So coefficients are different for different types of development. Obviously roads and paved surfaces have a very high coefficient because nothing is able to sink in, it just runs off. Single family has a little bit lower because you do have a rooftop, but you also have the landscape around those. So we used a mixture of those, of residential, multifamily, roads, runoff coefficients to show the improved site would produce about 37.78. If this number holds true through the design process, this would require to detain approximately eight acre feet. So some of the reasons those numbers are a little different, you see 28 to 37 is some of it has to do with flow rates. So obviously the flow rate of the road is gonna be very quick. The flow rate off of a subdivision might be a little slower. So with that being said, we've currently designed a proposed detention pond that could hold 10 acre feet. So we are not only hoping to detain that, we're hoping to keep even a little bit more, again, to slow the water as it releases down toward the Concho River. And that's what I have for my presentation. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Larry, Karen. Uh, you refer to existing drainage infrastructure a couple of slides back, I think. Uh, Was it this one? Uh, in bullet point two. Yes, bullet point two. Yeah. So <clears throat> describe to us, if you would please, what those existing drainage. Sure. So currently, if you look at the site, it drains to the southeast corner of the property where there is a drainage easement through an existing subdivision that is currently southeast of this property that then heads to the Concho River. So there are existing facilities that take the water from this unimproved site down to the river. So we are looking at how those will be affected. We do not want to increase the rate through those existing facilities, if that makes sense. I know that that the homeowners in the in the area that have objected consistently objected to this particular development proposal. I think we're all learning as we go, and and we thank you for your patience. But the concern was what happens with the drainage that's actually to the west and north of your property, where those two parallel roads run together, and there's a five foot deficit in in height. Um, and I think we even have the videos that were sent to us. We can show them publicly if we need to. So while it's not really your problem, uh, and you've, you've managed the, the puzzle for your own development beautifully, it is a problem for the city. And interestingly enough, yesterday's planning commission meeting, developers, multiple developers, got up and discussed in, in great length the need for improved drainage guidelines, if, if you will, for the city of San Angelo. So uh, apologize for dragging you through that sort of parallel conversation, but it is relevant and it does concern the property owners. So if you could help us understand why what you're doing doesn't matter to that, maybe that would reassure those homeowners. Well, and I will say it does matter. I mean, we are hoping that by cutting these streets through, maybe we could take some of that water and pull it onto our side and stored in our detention pond. I mean, I think that we can help through the process. The ultimate goal for the city's regulations and for us is not to make a problem worse. So I hope that we can even make it better. Um, we cannot affect the drainage that was already occurring on another site. I wish there was a way that, an easy way we could help, but our current site sits about five or six feet above that. So I'm not sure there's even a possibility to remedy that existing problem. 
Well, mm-hmm. and I mean, making maybe working together between all of us, there could be some possible solution. But I know that water really wants to drain north toward the Red Arroyo. And right now there's stuff that's stopping it. So, I mean, that that could be looked at. Those are individual property owners that we do not have connections to. So um, I'm not sure that we could change it. We're hoping to make it a little bit better, if anything. I think the key here is that the drainage issue is a city's issue from Foster Road and the development will not increase the existing city problem. Yes, ma'am, that's our goal for sure. And so we need to separate those two conversations because approval of this and and determining what's right or what's wrong is got, it's a separate conversation for the city and Foster Road. This is draw a hard line between the two and look at this as a property opportunity or conversation about what can or cannot be improved within this existing land. And all new plats have to have a drainage study. And the plat cannot and will not be approved until the planning committee has determined that the flooding potential issues have been addressed within this. That's the obligation. Correct. And and we have a long process ahead of us through this property. Um, As stated earlier, we'll have to seek annexation. We will have to seek rezoning, which you will see the platting process is a whole process where they're going to require us to have the plans for the streets and the drainage study. And all those things will be improved through your engineering services. Lucy, do you have any question? No, ma'am. Harry? No, ma'am. Tom? No, ma'am. Tommy? Hillary, can you talk a little bit, because while the mayor said it is a hard line, I agree, between the, the Foster Road drainage, that's that's not y'all's issue. However, as you, I assume, some of those streets will come through and cross what what is now Cox and ultimately tie into Foster. Yes, sir. There will be some... Sloping, I guess is the right word, of the roadways to be able to connect the roadways. So, again, this is an assumption. I assume your drainage study will have to take into account whatever water might be coming from your development onto ultimately Foster Road. Correct. Those flow rates would have to be looked at to maintain current flow. So, and that... it, it, so yes and no, right? right yeah. It's yes and no, but uh, still, it's something that, that that has to be addressed, even though we've got a totally separate issue right now on Foster, which I think they are beginning to address. I went out there Saturday. It looks like to me they're starting to work through the easement back there to start addressing some of that. Well, that's that great drain. news. Yeah, I think that's what what's happening. Yes, sir. Appeared to me. So I, I just wanted to, to to clear that up that y- y'all would be addressing any issues that your development possibly would create as it as it uh, tied in some roadways in, into into. Uh, foster at some point. Correct. As those plans are created and uh, grading plans, drainage plans, all those will factor into each decision. But yes, they will be ultimately looked at and approved by the Engineering Services Division. Yes, sir. All right. With that, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve as present. I have a second. Second by Harry. Public comment, please. Hi, Brandy Beal, single member district one. These plans that are presented are not conceptual to the homeowners that have been working on, on these homes for decades. The, the, this, this is our future. This is our front yard. This is not conception. To have a retainage pond in the southeast corner of this development will do nothing to the drainage issues that are currently on Foster Road that flow into the north. I appreciate that the mesquite and so forth has been cleared towards that area. Perhaps that will help a little bit. But mesquite in our area, you can clear something to the ground for acres 
and it will be back in three years to a level where you can't even pass through it. Mesquite grows quickly. It grows in my front yard. It grows to the side. And clearing this land is not a long-term solution. These streets will compound to the problem. That slope that is going to pass into Foster Road. So the math on that is you take the volume of the street. So if it's going to be match the same width of Foster, we're talking 52 to 60 inches, or 52 to 60 feet. You take the volume of the road times the precipitation in inches, and you multiply that by 0 0.623, and that yields how many gallons that you're going to add to this intersection where thousands of cars are going to pass daily. That traffic count was presented again to you in the same way it was last time. Very small numbers that was almost impossible for us to see on the screen. It wasn't presented publicly prior to this meeting. And I, I, again, I feel that the traffic needs to be looked at because that's going to add to the drainage issues. You have that many cars going through this drainage. That's a safety issue for the residents of San Angelo. This plan, we talked about that curve to Cox Road. This plan continues to have traffic pass at a curve. The only difference is that now, instead of there being a barricade at that curve, there is a home. There is a home that if someone does not navigate that curve right through the several inches of water that rests on Foster Road, it's not going to be one car into a barricade. It's going to be one car into a family's home. A last council meeting asked that, Mayor Gunter asked that the whole presentation, not just a piece, because there's no going back. This is not just one portion. It's not just the abandonment, because once that takes place, the rest is a cascade of water flowing downhill. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you. Other public comment? Hi, my name's Melissa Rodicus. I live at 1601 Parkview, and we're back again. Um, still very, very concerned about the drainage right in front of my house. No matter what kind of retaining pond they're talking about putting in the south corner, there's still going to be water coming down that slope if they build a street there, which puts more water right there into the intersection of the video that I showed y'all. It's already terrible if we get more than a quarter of an inch of rain, which, you know, we don't get a whole lot of rain, but when we do, it's a very bad situation. So I still have that same concern about the drainage. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up, I brought up at the last meeting as well, Parkview is considered a collector street, and that keeps coming up in these thoroughfare plans. It will never connect to arterial streets. Since part of it has already been abandoned across the railroad tracks, it will never connect to Knickerbocker, will never connect to Sunset. So I don't know how it can be designated a collector street when it will never collect and move traffic to an arterial street. Lastly, I just want to bring up, and it may or may not be an issue, just something to think about. Um, I spoke with the fire chief after the last meeting and asked them about their response plans and if Cox Lane was actually factored in to their response plans. And the answer was yes. The fire department, the police department, the DPS, they all use Cox Lane. SAISD uses Cox Lane every day. So, you know, a change in the street is going to change what their response plans are. And going to the loop 
to take to South Bryant is not part of their response plans today. So it may make them better, it may make them worse, but if it makes it worse even a minute, do you want your family to be the one waiting on a, an ambulance for an extra minute? So just something to think about. So thank you. Thank you again. Further public comment? All right, seeing none, we will take a vote. Uh, we'll start with um, Tommy. Uh, aye. Tom? Uh, Harry? Aye. Mayor Gunter? Aye. Lucy? Aye. Karen? Can I say I'm not sure? <laughs> no. Um, I'm a no. Larry? Aye. Motion passes six to one. All right, we'll move on to the next item, which is item number F. First reading and public hearing of an ordinance for Z22-25 to rezone properties from the high-rise multifamily residential zoning district to the single-family residential zoning district being 12.097 acres, generally located at the southeast corner of Bloom Street, or Blum Street, I'm not sure if it's Bloom or Blum, and East 40th Street, John. Thank you, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, this, you may recall, a couple of years ago was rezoned, uh, actually 2019, just seems like a couple. Um, this was rezoned for multifamily. Uh, there was a project proposed for an apartment complex, a fairly large apartment complex in this area um, that uh, apparently fell through. Uh, new owners have acquired the property and now want to rezone it back to single family residential. Uh, and so that's what's before you today. And that, that picture is just a uh, layout of their uh, preliminary plat of that area for single family. You may recall that the, uh, the neighbors, uh, many of the neighbors were opposed to that zoning to multifamily. And so uh, they are in favor of this, uh, this change. So uh, we did send out 33 notifications to the surrounding properties, 12 in support. So again, very supportive of taking this back to single family. Again, it is a neighborhood designation, so it is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, it's also consistent with the surrounding area, which the rest of the surrounding area is all single family or ranch and estate. Uh, the staff does recommend approval, as did the Planning Commission unanimously at their January meeting. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for John on this property? Uh, Lucy? I just have a question, John. How many homes are, are, you, are they planning on building? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's quite a few. Um, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, 137. 137. Okay, yeah, and again, you can see there the, the, the layout of it. Okay, Harry? Tom? Strongly in support. Tommy. Then do I have a motion for approval? I'll make a motion to approve. Tom, it's in your district. You have a motion for approval, second by Harry. Any public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 7-0. We'll move on to item G, first reading public hearing of ordinance on the following cases for property being 0.743 acres located at 3, 5, and 9 West Avenue J. One, the CP22-07, a request for approval of an amendment to the comprehensive plan changing, changing certain lands from the commercial to the neighborhood future land use designation. And two, Z22-26, a request for approval of a rezoning from the general commercial, heavy commercial zoning district to the single family residential zoning district. John, you're on. Thank you. The as you mentioned, this is a rezoning from commercial to single family. You can kind of see here at some point in the past along Chadburn Street, they just basically drew a line down the street on either side and said that's all commercial. Uh, but there are these three, uh, what were platted as residential lots that are currently vacant. Uh, and so uh, 
the owner wants to uh, develop those as single family lots. And so uh, that's the purpose for this rezoning, basically extending uh, the residential zoning out to incorporate those three lots. Um, we did send out our uh, notifications and received two in opposition. I don't believe they had any specific responses as to why they're opposed. Um, but uh, Typically you would think since it's gone from commercial to residential, there wouldn't be an opposition uh, that's generally right. the other way around, so mm -hmm. I'm exactly. not sure. There. Right, and in fact, it allows for heavy commercial on that property, so. Um. Okay, no questions? All right, with that, may I have a motion for approval? Move to approve. Here, uh, motion by Harry, seconded by Tommy. Any public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. None opposed. Motion passes 7-0. Item H, first reading in public hearing of ordinances on the following cases for property being approximately 15.325 acres and located northeast of the intersection of Montauk, um, Montauk Avenue and Vex Street. 1 CP 2208, a request for approval of an amendment to the comprehensive plan changing the future land use from commercial and transitional to neighborhood, and two, Z22-27, a request for approval of a rezoning from general commercial zoning district to the plan development zoning district. John, you're on. Thank you. This is located near the uh, Houston Heart Freeway. Uh, you can see on the screen where the area we're talking about, it's currently zoned general commercial, as you can see. They want to leave general commercial at the part up close to the freeway, uh, but then rezone the more southerly part uh, for single family. It's actually a planned development because they want the flexibility to do RS1, which is single family, or RS3, which is uh, zero lot line or townhome kind of development did send out our notifications, did not receive any responses in favor or against. Uh, staff is recommending approval, uh, as did the Planning Commission unanimously. I move to approve. Second. Seconded by Karen, a motion by Lucy. Any public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Seeing, hearing no negatives, we will uh, consider that approved seven to zero. And then the last item is item I, first reading a public hearing of an ordinance for Z22-29 to rezone property from the single-family residential zoning district to the two-family residential zoning district located at 1201 Coberland Street. Thank John? you. As you said, it's a rezoning from RS1 to RS2. It would allow a duplex on this property. Uh, this is an old church building. Uh, and as you know, it's often a struggle of what do you do with a church when the church goes away. Uh, oftentimes people look at them for commercial or something which aren't always appropriate for a neighborhood. In this case, they think they can just convert that existing church building into two units, a duplex. Uh, and so that's the reason for this request. Um, we did send out our notices, no uh, opposition from the surrounding neighbors. You can see a couple of pictures. This is the front of the church on the left, and this is the back uh, of the church. And, and this sort of uh, area in the back is where the parking was for the, uh, the church when it was a church. Um, staff does recommend approval, and the uh, Planning Commission also did unanimously. Any questions for John on this item? Move to approve. I have a motion and a second. Any public comment? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 7-0. We will now move into our closed session. Executive session under the provision of Government Code Title V, Open Government Ethics, Subtitle A, Open Government Chapter 551, Open Meetings, Subchapter D, Exceptions to the Requirement that Meetings Be Open under the following sections. A, Section 551.072, Deliberations about real property regarding 122.36 acres out of Survey 644, Abstract 1181 West Spornhahn, and out of Survey 645, Abstract 4212 Z Sesh, Section 551087, Business Prospect Negotiations regarding Project Sienna and Section 551087, Business Prospect Negotiations Regarding Skyline Aviation, and D, Section 551074, Personal Matters to Deliberate at the, uh, the Appointment of the City Clerk. At this point, we are adjourned from our regular agenda. 
and we will move into our closed session at this point. Meeting back to order at 1229 on the 21st of February. And uh, Daniel has an announcement to make following executive session. I do. It is my honor to announce our, our new city clerk, uh, Heather Stastny. She has been with the city for quite a while now. She's actually been with the department for, for two years. And uh, she's picked up so much knowledge. She's going to do a wonderful job for us. And I just want to con congratulate Heather on this appointment and the city council support. Okay, so with that, uh, the next item is consider approving various board nominations. Civil Service Commission Brian Dunn, which is a city manager appointment to a first term ending January 2026. The Construction Board of Adjustments and Appeals, Scott Allison, Mayor, to a second term ending February 2025. Do I have a motion for approval of those two appointments? Move to approve. A move, a motion by second. Lucy, a second by Tom. Uh, any public comment concerning those two? No, there is not, so we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Item C is announcements and consideration of future agenda items. Are there any? Seeing none, we will ask for a motion for adjournment. Second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 The City Council meeting at um, 1221 is adjourned at 1231. Done. Nice job, team.